Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback, Last Stand Media's, what is this, our retro podcast? I haven't done this in so long. Feels like I haven't done this in- Retro and nostalgia podcast. Retro and nostalgia podcast. God, it's been like, it's been a while. Since it's I've been a minute, it. man. Yeah, because you had PJ on last time. Yes. And then we took a week off because you had some job stuff to do. So we um, did a Sacred Symbols Plus episode, like a second Sacred Symbols Plus episode that week. That's that was right. supposed to kind of be a knockback episode that we just never got to. So yeah, here I am back in the driver's seat, ready to go. Back apparently. in the saddle. How are you, my friend? How does it feel? Oh, it feels good. Thank you. I mean, you're used to it. Um, Used to being in that pilot seat. My yeah, friend. I'm getting a little tired of it, but yeah, it's here I am. <laughs> I put in a lot of long hours. Yeah. The burnout is real. Well, I've recorded a lot this week because uh, I think I've recorded like Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, something like that. So it's a lot. It's wow, a lot. that's yeah. a lot. So all but one day. Right. So, that's the most I've ever done. And I've only done that a couple of times. And yeah. That's, Listen. It sounds like it would be easy yeah, to somebody does. who doesn't do it, but it's so exhausting. It could be very, it's exhausting. It's draining. You know, it, no, it totally um, is, dude. When I'm done with sacred symbols, like four or five hours, it's like I'm dead. Like, I'm not saying it's hard work. It's just it could be tedious work and it is exhausting work to, to stay engaged like that. It's engagement. how many of you engage in five hour conversations with people? Are you kidding? None of you. None of you do that. You know? Now, how often do you have a week like that, though? Um, Fairly like probably every other week or every three weeks, I'll have like a really, a really lot. busy week. Th- now that we do sacred symbols plus left less often. So, for instance, next week, we don't do knockback and I'm not doing Sacred Symbols Plus because that's going to be other guys doing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So my week next week is actually fairly light, which is nice. So it doesn't really nice. matter. My bigger thing right now that I'm bummed about is that I wanted to get up earlier today. Like I got up at like 12 something. I wanted to get up at like 11 to try to mow the lawn before we recorded, but I just I wasn't able to get it. So I, after this, I have to get out there and mow the lawn because it is getting. You do it after. Yeah, it's getting. It's just like, you know, it's nice to get that stuff done and then feel like it's not lingering. Yeah. It's not hanging over your head. Right. But I got to get out there and do that afterwards, which is going to be a whole to do, but that'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, man. That's uh, what I want to tell you. Oh, I wanted to tell you two things. One was connected to our conversation on Constellation yesterday, but Lilia and Helene just left a couple hours ago for one of Lilia's dance competitions. This is competition season for her. So they travel. They don't go too far, but they're up in North Jersey today. So I just wanted to text Lilia before you and I started. Just said, good luck, babe. You know, whatever. Break a leg. that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I don't, I don't say break a leg, although it always occurs to me. But did you have you and I ever discussed this before? Where does that come from? It sounds like there must be some kind of origin to it. Is it supposed? Is it just intended irony? Like, are you just saying wishing the worst possible outcome? As like a, it's not not necessarily a humorous thing, but this must date back to performances. You know, whether it's stage or dance or ballet or something this has to date back decades if not centuries right in the early days of theater this is where ensemble actors were cued to perform if actors were not performing they had to stay behind the leg line which also meant that they couldn't get paid if you were to tell the actor to break a leg you were wishing them the opportunity to perform and get paid this is according to transcendence theater the wikipedia let's see Break a leg is a typical English idiom used in the context of theater and other performing arts to wish a performer good luck. An ironic or non-literal saying of uncertain origin, a dead metaphor. Break a leg is commonly said to actors and musicians before they go on stage to perform or, uh, b- before an audition. Though the term likely originates in German, the English esp- expression is first attributed to the 1930s or possibly 1920s, originally oh. documented without specifically theatrical associations. Among professional dancers, the tradition of saying is not break a leg, but the French word merd, M-E-R-D-E. Married. Okay. I I could see the French origins. I thought it would be older than that. I thought it would refer to theater or, you know. Well, specifically among professional dancers. So you should text her M-E-R-D-E and see if she understands that because that's that's pretty that's pretty dope. That would be a very. Plus, she's got years of French under her belt like you and I did. It means. Yeah, I thought so. Married in French is shit. (laughs) Is that Um, what it is? I think so. She probably speaks better French than me. But anyway. Uh that's, That's interesting. Yeah, but I never say that to her because it's your kid. You know what I mean? Like you don't, I just, I can't bring myself to do it. Although I get the irony. I get the irony. 
That's what I always thought. But yeah, I always think about that when I text her, especially this time of year, because she's, you know, she's off on the weekends doing the competitions, I guess, five or six weeks in the spring. So yeah, it was just on my mind. It was just on my mind. I love it. I love dead. I love dead idioms like that. Like, uh, People still say it though. Yeah, well, the, the metaphor is dead though. Like no one knows where it came from. And I, I become aware of that kind of stuff often. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but like I think of things sometimes like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, what does that mean? Why do we, and that's what, that's as I understand what makes part of what makes English, learning English difficult is that we really bastardize the language in these different ways where people have no idea what you're even talking about half the time, unless you are, I'm sure every language is like that, but I hear that from English second speakers where like there are things that people say where it's like, wait a minute, what? Yeah. You know, and it's like, you, you know, oh, think. no, that means this. Like when you say that strange thing, it means this in- indeed. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, so. I think there is probably some irony there. I say it all the time to people, you know, um, you know, when, when they go on stage or when someone's performing Ramon or someone, it's like, yeah, break leg. You know, I said it it's to 311's face. And that's what oh, Nick you, and what? that's what Nick Hexum said. Yeah, cool. Oh no! <laughs> I told I, I told that story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It becomes a thing of like you have to say it's like polite to say it, but it becomes so rooted in our vocabulary that we stop questioning what it means because it's just we grew up with it. Right, like it was I, around way before we were around. I think some performers would take like literal good luck as a bad omen. Oh. Which is That's why I really started so saying don't say more. good luck. Yeah, like if you're in that space, I don't know. Yeah, like no good luck. Not goodbye. See you later. No, it's not the same thing. Either. You know what's funny about that? Yeah. I was trying to say that in a tweet the other day and I couldn't think of what it was. You know, like it's just an old senior moment. I was just like, what is that? Not, it's not goodbye. Like, and I'm I for- gave, yeah, I just I- want completely different i'm forgetting things often these days like i don't know if it's the weed or like early onset dementia or whatever but i'm like i think about that a lot there i'm like i'm like damn dude like i definitely don't know the word anymore like it's i like don't know what the word i'm looking for anymore i cannot possibly think of the word and then someone will say something and i pull it like out of nowhere like the information like a good example do you know who kathy mitchell is the dump dinners woman do you know dump dinners no no okay so i got it's like you know in the like the circular thing like the magazine rack at like the 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 uh, grocery store when you're at the register yeah, and there's like all the sure. different magazines and there's often yeah. food magazines. There was this woman. If you don't know her, it's not going to be as funny. But there's like this re- old redhead woman that used does this thing called dump dinners. Like I that's what know. they're literally called. I'm going to see if I can find it for you. And Michael was like, "What is that woman's name?" And I'm like, "Kathy Mitchell." I'm like, "How?" And then I literally said, "Like how the fuck?" Yeah, how did you know that? Did Are I you know subscribing that? Subscribing to the mag. Wait, let's see. Dump Kathy dinners. Mitchell. Oh, it's food. Is it a food network thing? No, no. They like dump dinner is like a term that people like robbed now, uh, but she made it up. Like it's the, here. I'm, it. I'm, I'm, I think I have it. Yeah. Here. Oh, wait, I see her. Oh, there she, she looks like Mrs. Poole. She does look like Mrs. Poole. That's exactly right. But it was, 100%. I was afraid to even, I was afraid to even make the reference because you and I might be the only per- people that didn't even <laughs> know who Mrs. Poole is. <laughs> Who of course is Heidi the na- who, of, who of course is the neighbor in the Hogan family? Heidi Ho Heidi Hogan's. Hogan's. <laughs> Heidi Ho Hogan's. Dude, dude, how she, awesome was the Hogan family's house though? With Sandy what, Duncan, they had that fucking huge open space in the in the in the bottom floor. It was dope. It was like one of the dopest houses. There were so many cool houses in the. Yeah, that By the was way, a that's, good house. People don't like visual constellations, but I do want to do that one day because I saw it on, I, I, honestly, like I saw it on Twitter and I think it's a really funny idea is like, name this show by just showing the living room. I so love like, that. Like, and some of them that's are like family great. ties and whatever. And I was like, I, I was seeing it, I'm like, oh, it's idea. fucking who's the boss. And then oh, I was writing dude. all that kind of stuff. And uh, that would be like a legendary one because it's so huge that it's such a huge open it's a set. I, feel, I mean, it's so obviously like there doesn't make any sense really when you think about it, but I do remember it. I'm getting it maybe a little confused with the, what was the Kirk Cameron sitcom again? Um, I forget the name. Uh, Growing Pains. Growing Pains. I'm getting it conflated. with No, the much bigger pains. than that one. That's a traditional Huntington, Long Island. Yeah. Let me see. Takes Hogan family. <laughs> That's a great room. idea though, dude. Just name the show by the set. The primary set, yeah, like family ties was iconic. Yeah, you love family ties. The boss was iconic because they're cross sections. They're clearly cross sections. Like, there's no there. There's you're missing one or two walls always because it's always shot from certain perspectives. 
because it's a soundstage. Right, exactly. And you, I, I, you're you're facing in in a multi camera sitcom setup. You're facing where the TV would be on in their room. Sometimes they'd even have the back of the TV. Remember, like Full House did that. Roseanne did that. Yes. To like kind Good of call. frame the fourth wall or whatever. Anyway, yeah. So we should do that at some time. Although I think. I don't think people like the visual ga- gags. I understand why, you know, because it's an audio show too. Yeah, sure. I just don't give a shit sometimes and I just want to do whatever I want to <laughs> yeah, do. to be able to engage with it. Yeah, in both ways. Yeah, no, I understand that too. What else was I going to... Oh, we were talking about Red Letter Media on Constellation quite a bit yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I had realized like I was behind an episode or two. So last night after dinner, I went up to just catch up. And f- I was five minutes in on one of the episodes I hadn't seen yet. And we were singing the praises of Rich Evans yesterday on the, the show. The best. He's the best. Dude, he made a joke within the first few minutes of that episode that I was belly laughing. And it was like a little off the cuff one line joke. You know what I mean? Obviously, completely improv. He made a joke that cracked everybody up and cracked me up so much. I had to stop the video. I was belly laughing so hard. Went back and listened to it another three times and was still like, that is, to be that funny in the moment, and he's not, he doesn't always do that, you know what I mean? But he does it enough, and it's strong enough where it's like, dude, these are, this is why these guys are the goats, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It was just, it was such a fun, it was such a funny punching up to what we discussed on the show, like exactly what the brilliance is. Yeah, it's funny, they... uh they are very, they're very funny. Like even in the beginning of their Andor episode, they were just basically being like, hey, we've avoided this for like as long as humanly possible. You know, like we've watched, we've tried so hard to not watch Star Wars and now, <laughs> now we're back. I really enjoyed their Star Trek stuff too because I'm not going to watch the Star Wars stuff, but I'm definitely not going to watch the Star Trek stuff. So I, yeah. I go into that with. Same. Like my whole, imper- my whole interpretation of everything from the next generation all the way through picard is all through red letter media like it's all i know about star trek so like they could be lying about everything and their encyclopedic knowledge like the quiz shows and stuff are so funny that they do because that's mike and rich's forte jay is not really in on. no that. he hosts those or whatever so he and hosts- they made him wear like a star trek outfit when he was hosting it like you know like the officer's outfit or whatever but i like that they don't all have to be star trek devotees mm-hmm. you know what i mean that, that's what's so cool about it you know it's just like really mike and then sort of rich and then jay is definitely out of that fandom you know, yeah, those guys are just, it, it was fun to just confirm everything we talked about, like in the first three minutes of watching what I hadn't seen yet. Now he had made the point or a uh, he, I'm like, I could be talking about anyone. He had made the point. Okay. Uh, Dustin made the point on Constellation that he mm. knows. So actually he doesn't know, but he was saying someone that writes at Second Wind is mm. one of their collaborators. And I had realized that because he was wearing a Second Wind shirt on one of their videos. And it's like, okay, I'm friends with Nick Calandra who runs second wind. We talk behind the scenes. He's been on the show. He openly says last stand was one of the major inspirations for their company. Oh, it's wow. like, so I do I this. utilize that connection to get to that guy to then try to open the door, but wouldn't they be inclined to want to do it with second wind, right? Like oh, they had an I option. I see what you mean. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it, would they just be like, oh, we already kind of have our game association thing. And, and even being reminded that they tried to do game content already because it would be so good. I'd love, they would dominate. I'm surprised that they didn't stick with that. Maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they wouldn't dominate. Maybe they're just not good at I it. Know. I have no idea. You know, I didn't even, Dustin hipped us to that. I didn't, I wasn't even aware they delved into that. But apparently it was only what, Jay and. No, I mean, it was, uh, it was Rich, Rich Evans and that guy Rich. that where I can't remember. The other, like I, I really only watch Mike Jay and Rich Evans. Yeah, stuff too. I've really, st- I, I have avoided the other guys, not because there's anything wrong with them, but that is, that's why I'm going through the back catalog and hitting all the things that they're in actually. Cause it's like, eh, I don't really want to listen to those guys. I just like, no, I see what you mean. The other kind are of they fourth, full fifth, and sixth. Or is there just three of them? No, there's Jack who's, I feel like Jack is kind of the number four. Is he like there's behind Colin, the scenes or something? Colin's on there once in a while. It seems like they have, they pull Colin in with Jay a lot and they discuss films usually. And then the other dude, he's a bi- he's a bigger dude. Yeah, he's I know not, who you're talking he's about. He's not a yeah. fat guy, but I can't remember his name. He, I feel like he's kind of the fifth guy. But I know what you mean. It's like the three. You want to see the three core. Yeah, like I wonder, know. like who's who, like what their pecking order is. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. For instance, um, last stand is me. That, of course. No. Who else would there be? <laughs> Figurehead. I renamed it so it would be more than just me. It's a monarchy. It is a monarchy. Um, 
You know what the thing is Benevolent. though with you? Let's say LSM in some way. Let's say sacred symbols, for sake of argument, and Red Letter Media collabed. They don't really need to do it financially. No, they don't need to. You do it guys all. definitely don't need to do it financially. It would have to be for fun. Well, Everybody would think would have to say, "All right, this could be a fun opportunity." Yeah, we're both very, we're both totally great with money. I would, I would say the. It, it, I would say they'd have no reason to do it. Period. Like we would have a reason to do it for the promotion and sure. because we love them. Like, sure. Good point. That's kind of the thing that I don't, I try to be, we were, it's so funny. We keep referencing our old shows, but we were talking about like meeting, meeting people, meeting people you love or whatever. Kind of having that one interaction and you can't assume it, but you almost want to be like, listen, I'm not a random fan in this case. Can I just give you one minute to explain the situation, right? Like, and not be weird. Like we are, a, we are a much smaller outfit, but we are bigger on Patreon. I think than you guys are as big on Patreon as you guys. We have a really loyal audience. We do our thing and we're a big fan. So I just want to let you know from that perspective that we would really love to collaborate with you. I'm not some like weird dude with a hundred YouTube subscribers or just like, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but like it, you want to give them that extra thing. Be like, no, no, I'm, I'm stupid, but I'm serious. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, yeah. I'm not. So, uh, and I said Put it on the show. I'm like, Rich just... Evans, like, dude, if he ever wants to explore gaming content ever again and they want to do it off brand, I would fucking fund that in two seconds. Two I seconds. Know, I know you would. I mean, and yeah, and amen. And you know what though, Kyle? I, I bet there's somebody over there, whether it's somebody in front of the camera or somebody behind the camera, they, they're definitely aware of you. I mean, just the, not only because of, who you are and, and and your reach, but also you got to understand like the size of your Patreon definitely must raise awareness of like who's doing it in the YouTube space and the podcast space. That's really, really successful. So they, somebody over there already, already knows you. Isn't it so weird though, dude? Like think about growing up, I don't know, 30 years ago. If you knew one major science fiction franchise. You knew them all. We're in this world now where you could have a really big following and be really successful and have a livelihood doing what you do. And another, you know, entity like Red Letter Media could do the same. And there could be a a core fan base that isn't even aware of the other. Like the, it's so big that the crossover is really kind of deceiving in some way. You know what I mean? Like it's weird to think Somebody could know Last End Media without knowing, let's say, for instance, Kind of Funny or Easy Allies. But those people exist. And that's strange. It's a very strange in media environment that we're in. You know what I mean? Where it, there, the crossover isn't what you think it would be. It's not a traditional conventional right. crossover, you know? No, it totally isn't. I love that the internet's so wonderful because people are making millions of dollars, like doing things where like it's like, who? You know, or like, like even it, I love our Patreon because it makes us a lot of money, of course, but it also, it's like the legitimizing factor of our company. So, cause you were brought up, it's like, if you look at our YouTube channel, we don't even have a hundred thousand subscribers. And right. I, I, I tell people to unsubscribe from our YouTube channel if they don't watch our videos, because I'm obsessed with having like accurate numbers and having, and having high, I want a high ratio like that. Like sometimes half of our subscribers watch an episode of sacred symbols, not unusually. I love that. Yeah. That makes awesome. you look good. That's so huge. I've definitely like hurt our own subscriber base. I would definitely be over a hundred thousand, but I went, didn't spend years telling people like, don't even bother subscribing if you're not going to watch or listen to anything. Um, but we don't do that. Like it, it would be very easy to look at these shows and be like, these shows don't do any traffic. You guys are irrelevant. And it's like comparable, right. To even a red letter media, like red letter media does more traffic in one episode than we do sometimes in six months, yeah. <laughs> you know, like on a show, on one yeah. of the shows. So, but it's like everyone stays there. Stay your sword, Captain. When they, when they uh, look at the Patreon, it's like, oh, no, we're legit. We just this is our KPI. Like yes. you guys care about YouTube traffic and whatever. It's like that's cool. I care about that too because we make a little money from that too on on ads and all of that. But no, as long as this looks like this, I could give a fuck what any of this looks like. But you have to be able to delve deep into that. So it almost looks like an irrelevance, but that's what's fun about the internet is that this is irrelevant. 
all of this shit is total. Everything in the last stand is totally irrelevant to the greater yeah, culture. It is like it's m- hilarious. You hi- you one. line up a hundred gamers in the world, and it's possible that all one hundred of them would have no idea what this is. That's so strange, you know. And yet, it's like this vibrant, thriving company, and there are many like it. And that just means that we have these amazing tools to proliferate specific niche ideas to specific niche audiences, and actually somehow make money on it. Like I was looking at, I, I followed these Jets Twitter accounts, and. uh Someone tweeted out. He's like, oh, I was going through my old stuff and I found this. And it was a newspaper, like a Jets newspaper that like these guys put out in the 80s and 90s. And it was once a week and it was two dollars and it would mail it to your house. And it was a fucking newspaper that like these dudes like wrote like this niche newspaper where they found somehow found an audience in like 1987 to subscribe to this weekly Jets paper for a hundred dollars a year or whatever. Okay. And that was how they made their money. And I was looking at it. And I was like, that's so fucking wild because that what that seems almost impossible. Like when you hear about early. You hear about this, especially in computing, like in the 70s and into the 80s, like uh, newsletters, like the yeah. term news. I don't think people realize this, like the term newsletter comes from like the homebrew computer club era. People literally writing physical newsletters and sending them out. Now, that's how you like contacted people before Usenet or anything like that, right? And yeah, obviously before the internet, list. yeah, or as we understand the internet. So, yeah, that's a precursor. So, dude, right? I guess what I'm saying is, is like it's you can ma- it's like being in a, an endless mall or on a TV channel with a m- infinite channels, where yeah. like you have a storefront and you could actually do it, and you don't even need that much foot traffic. You just need loyalty enough. You know? Yeah. Yep. You need enough. Yeah, and I, dude, I it's so it's really well put. And I agree with you that it is fun. And it's, it reminds me of what I told you. I don't know if this was like two or three years ago. I said, wouldn't it be fun to have you take you around, let's say the East Coast, and drive you to GameStops and see how many people in the GameStops recognize you? You might get through a GameStop on a busy Saturday. Not a single person in there recognizes you. You might get to another one. There's five fans, Sacred Symbols fans. And that's kind of, a, kind of a, another way of saying you know what I mean? You could have this successful business. You can make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and be very successful and just have a, a, enough of that slice of that audience that, again, you just, it, I think you said it right. It's the, it's the, a certain subsection and that loyalty doesn't need to be massive, a massive slice of the pie, but it needs to be a sliver, at least a loyal sliver. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. what's so strange to me. A lot of people do know kind of funny and easy allies and red letter media and last day media, but there's some of those people only know one or two. Right. Well, like Brad, space, like Brad saw right? a guy in New York City who was like, I'm a huge fan of easy allies. Love what you guys do. And so like and Brad didn't correct him or whatever, which is fine. I don't give a shit. Yeah, sure. But sure. and it's a nice sentiment, but it goes to show you that people even just know you in time. Like there are probably people that I tell you, I'm telling you when I'm at like BJ, sometimes I can feel a person staring at me and like look up and they're staring at me and they know me from something. Yeah. But it's, I only meet people only say things to me in very unusual spaces. Like GameStop would be where I would expect not to find anyone for some reason. Like that's interesting. I, I went out with a friend when I first moved to Virginia for dinner at this like burger spot. And um, we were, and she was asking me like, Oh, do you ever get like recognized by anyone? And I was like, Sometimes, but not really. I mean, and, and I, I think I said something like it's not going to happen out here. Like it's just not a thing. And then it literally got up. We were leaving and someone recognized me and she took a picture of us together. Like of, love of me that. and that guy. And I'm like, that's it. I was like, dude, that's almost like I wrote it. You never know. Yeah. You couldn't have wrote. You couldn't have scripted that. Which was so funny. I was like, that's so weird. But generally speaking, I, I as I noted on Constellation, like I feel like people around that are in my area in Virginia know, like if they're fans, they know and they kind of we're going to be in the same spaces. There's not that many of us here. It's not like that crowded. Yeah. So like we see the same cars sometimes and like see our neighbor's car at some random store like this and that. And it's like, it's not that it's a pretty small world. So, yeah, um, but I'm glad to not be recognized usually because it's not it's no offense to people. It's just like it's. Uh, it's awkward for me, like, I, for instance, when I was recognized in the airport on the way home from the New York City show, it was cool. It was nice to meet that guy. But I noticed certain people looking at us being like, who the fuck is this guy? And then like people are looking at me trying to figure out who you are. And I'm like, and I want to be like, dude, listen, I'm irrelevant. Like they think I'm like an actor or like something. <laughs> Should I get an autograph too? Yeah, Should I get like, in there? And, and it's like, and that that's always the thing I notice that happens to me in those situations. Like I'm often seen in airports. And, it, and I, that I don't mind, but it's like, yeah, it does attract this attention. Like, who the hell is that guy? Yeah, that's funny. And I'm like, I'm the not, I'm buzz. not, dude, I'm literally like a, an E-list internet celebrity, like at best, at best. 
Don't so, you think you're right in that right sweet spot though, definitely. where you have the anonymity, but you also have a modicum of fame that fuels your livelihood. So you're in like this really nice oh, perfect. spot. I couldn't want, I couldn't wish for anything more than I have right now. It's perfect. I'm not a greedy man. Like this is so <laughs> much above and beyond anything I ever imagined I would be able to do. Yeah. So like I'm, I'm really good. I'm not that yeah, hungry. There are dudes spot, that are hungry. Dude. They're like, I want to become a billionaire and stuff. And it's like, I don't give a fuck. You know, <laughs> I can give You're a like, fuck less about becoming a billionaire. All right. Um, Dave, let's get into the topic. All right. We brought up roll. the New York City show and I did. Mm-hmm. And it's a good place to set off, set this off because this is where the idea came from. Um, I was thinking about what I wanted to do for this episode of Knockback. We've been doing some more personal ones lately. Some of them do better traffic in, than others. But I think it's people are hardcore fans of the sh- of the the ecosystem we've built, like the lore building. We've done a lot of lore building with our families. But I was thinking, you know, as I started out at the show, I did a little like just walked around the stage, did like a little sub sub routine of something. I don't know, you know, like some just a little this and that. And was thanking people for coming and telling a few jokes. And I thanked mom and dad. And I said, you know, they both came independently. Our parents are obviously divorced 32 years. Um, But they came and they were there and they supported me. And I said on the stage, you know, my mom's my biggest fan and she is like the most loyal, the most hardcore note, like listens to the shows. And it's just like, it's amazing like to have a mother like that. Like I, it's, I don't actively take it for granted, but I passively take it for granted. Where it's like, this is, oh, this is the way it is. Your mom's like fucking really passionate about you. She loves you. A lot of people grow up with their parents not giving a fuck about them, you know? And to this day, my mom or our mom comes and supports me in the live shows. And want, you know, when we go to London, she wants to come to that show. And she's been to all the different shows, really. And our dad came and obviously it was local to him too. But I remember him even when we did the Virginia show specifically, he's like, oh, you didn't tell me about the show. And he was almost like insulted. And I had just assumed, I'm like, I don't want to put you out there. Like, you don't need to come to this show, but they right, want right. to, like, they want to show their support. They want to see their son in action or their sons now in action. And I was telling Dagan, I was like, for this, for a, to- we should do a topic about mom and dad, but about what we appreciate about them. Because we, first of all, I think we have great parents. And I'm, I'm saying that not because I'm biased, but because I think that they were generally They came, they came, let's not say great, because maybe we didn't have a nuclear family for a a while there, but good parents. They were attentive. They were there. They would go to parent teacher conferences. They would bring you to hockey. They would buy you groceries. They would like, we were really, and it's not we, Dagan was out of the house by the time any of this happened. But while my, my childhood was confused and fucked up, it, I wasn't without, had a roof over my head, had leisure activities, did well in school, had access to the library and stores. And my parents would give me an allowance and. You know, I would do chores, I guess, in that in that case. But we typically, because we think it's hysterical, just bust (laughs) our parents' balls constantly. (laughs) And on the show, because there are some, they're weird, and there's so many weird things about them. You know, like they are weird people, and so am I. I'm weird as fuck, probably because I I come from them. But I was like, you know what? Look how rock solid. When I was standing there on stage, especially reflecting on it, I was like, well, how rock solid are our parents? You know, like how. How amazing is it that at 73, both of them, yeah, they don't look it, but they're both they're 73. Really they come they're in really. to the city, mom going way out of her way. Dad, you know, dad lives out east now on Long Island in the Hamptons. Yeah. Like it's not a short tr- trip. Come in and see us. Does dad do the weird Irish goodbye? Yes. Yes. Um, of course. Fully Irish. But, and that, but I baked in the Irish goodbye shit forever because i love irish goodbyes too by the way i do i used to do them at parties all the time when you i was just vanish what did you say you just vanish oh yeah just like i would go to a party with people in san francisco and then an hour later i'd just be gone <laughs> you know it's like a cat darting out of the room that's really what it always reminds me of you know yeah i didn't even get to say goodbye to him yeah so no yeah, me neither because he wanted to like he had to work the next day i think because it was a sunday night and he wanted to get home and i was like traffic out to long island on sunday night i don't think so okay anyway never mind that <laughs> I, i'm not gonna make fun it. of mom and dad in this episode as best as i can i'm not gonna say i'm not going to but as best as i can <laughs> it's so difficult um i even didn't <laughs> they're fun to give up they're fun to uh to give a hard time to yeah like yeah. i held back on my i didn't want to insult dad too. well not that he would be insulted but i want to pick on him too much where i was going to do the whole like you know grow up with dad 
where we had paper towels, but weren't allowed to use them. Why weren't we allowed <laughs> to use the paper towels? W what was going on with the paper towel? Like, why were they so precious? You know, um, but we didn't get to that. So I don't know. I was just thinking about them in the moment and I thought we would do an episode kind of an ode to them about their great qualities of which I think that they have many and the way that they instill those qualities in us and just some of the positive remembrances and remarks you might have about mom and dad as we build the it. lore of the Moriarty family. Cause it, like we've, we've set the cadence so unbalanced and so unevenly that it's not as crazy as it seems. So maybe we should ground it a little bit. I like it. I like it, dude. I, yeah. I mean, they're fun. It's, they're fun to, uh, it's fun to bust their chops. We do quite a bit of ribbing, right? It's all, it's always playful. It's always in jest. It's always out of love, definitely. but yeah, we definitely, I, I like to call this episode pulling mom and dad out from under the bus <laughs> a little bit. Now, are they going to get thrown under the bus here and there? Probably. But yeah, but I like this, I like this for that reason because they, re they really are good people. And you know what? The proof's in the pudding, man. Like time tells all tales, right? Like if you look, I always knew they were good parents, but now looking back, being 50 years old and just looking back at any given year, any period, it's like, yeah, they were just they were good parents. They were always present. They were always available. You know, they always took care of us. We never really wanted for anything. You know, no, were we spoiled rotten? No, they didn't really have the resources for that. But they were, you know, there there is a lot to say here. And you know what else I love about this man? I was thinking about this last night as I started to jot down a few notes. You um you're getting a little sentimental in your old age. I see like a little bit of a softening. There's a there's a a brighter sort of I don't know what you would call it, like a uh, little easier, little easier, breezier column emerging, you know? And I think that's what happens. Now you're not 40 yet, but when when you get step into your early 40s, I think that's what happens. That was my experience too. You just don't I don't know. You know what I think it is, man? I honestly think it's like that masculine energy just kind of naturally dissipating a little bit. You, like the testosterone just gets a little diluted. It's funny you say that because I we were at dinner last night and we we really like this place that we go to, but it wasn't the greatest service experience for us. Mm. Like the woman like didn't come to our table very quickly at all. Then like the, our, my drink was wrong. Then my entree was wrong. Then we sent the entree back. They just never brought the entree back. We had like this really weird interaction. Me? It was horrible. It was horrible. Like, oh, that's it does suck because I was like, I like the food. I like that place. But you, it's it's about like it's so funny about the softening where I was I told Mike, I'm like, if this was me 10 years ago, I would have been so pissed. You've been and irate. Th and then I literally said something like, oh, maybe she's just having a bad day. Like, so, you know, and I'm like, I almost like as I was coming out of my mouth, I was like, what? Yeah. You know, like you're not even used to it yet. Yeah. Like where I'm like, that's so she ruined your meal. Like she was a total space cadet. She fucked your meal up. Like, it's like you should say something to her at least. And it's like, no, nah, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. You become a kinder, gentler Weird. version of yourself. I, you I, I know yeah. what you're going through because I see a lot of what I was going through 10 years, just 10 years ago, a decade ago. It's I see that in you, and I don't even get to see you a lot. You know, what I mean? I'm I'm looking at you through a webcam all the time, and we're having these exchanges on podcasts. Yeah. But I could I could see it, so I think it's actually. I mean, I don't. You know, I love you either way, but I think it's really cute that it's going. You know, that you want to pull mom and dad out and say, well, let's sing their praises for once. You know, and there is a lot to say. There is. You know that they, they they did a lot. You know, they were good. They're good people, and they continue to be good people. You know what else I find hilarious though. The fact you thought you could keep mom away from the New York show. There was just no, once she found out that trajectory is like a comet. There's no stopping. That no, way. I know. It's just, it, I worry about mom. Mom and dad are the same age, but dad, I've said this before and I want to, I'm not trying to tempt fate, but it just feels like dad is f like going to live forever. Like he's the same, like he's just exactly the same. And I feel like mom's getting older. Like we can tell and feel it that mom's getting older. And I don't want her to put herself out as much as she used to because she used to come to new york city for the fucking new york comic-con stuff and like she was always sure. she, and that's the whole point is how how wonderful she's been in that regard but i don't want to put her out so it's not that i'm trying to hide her from her from it i just wanted it's like you don't have to come like it's not that big of a deal you don't need to be there and i don't really have time to tend to you so it's like you have to understand what you're kind of getting into that's kind of the bummer about these events is especially in a home and on the home field like in new york where it's like pj's there and mike patelli's there and it's yeah. like, but I really have no time for you guys, unfortunately. Right. 
I appreciate you guys coming out. It's awesome that you're showing support, but we'll get a few minutes. That's why I was disappointed that dad left because I didn't even really talk. I didn't even really talk to dad, you know, like much at all. So no, I know. So, um, yeah. And so it, I, I do, I do agree that I'm, I do agree. Micah says the same thing. It seems like I'm like, I, I am sentimental. I've always been nostalgic. I've always yeah. lived in the past always, but yeah. I have become sentimental. And I do think those are two different things. So, yeah. yeah, I could see that. I could see it in the offing, my friend. You know what else is funny though? I think mom, dad, PJ and Kim sort of formed this foursome at the live show. So they were kind of with each other hanging out. And PJ was cracking me up because he said at, some, at one point, some fan came up to mom and thanked her for having you. <laughs> and I was like, dude, do you even, this is exactly what's going to go on when she shows up at this event. This is nothing new. It's only new to you because you haven't been around yet. You know what I mean? So I was like, yeah. I think dad that's, thinks that's, it's like the, the fandom's weird. You know, like that, that like, like I can, I can sense that in him. Mom, I think likes the attention. She loves it. You know, which is cool. She loves and I appreciate it. that. I, I get it. Cause I've got, I've, I've gotten so much attention in those things and it is nice. Like you get used to it. And so you don't really lean into it anymore, but it is cool. It's different for a lot of people. Dad, I think thinks it's like, wow, who the, like, this is my stupid son who like never left his bedroom, you know? But, uh, I think he's proud of you, but he doesn't want to have any part of that. No, right. Exactly. Where mom's embracing it. You could see mom, the way she interacts with the community on Twitter. You know what I mean? She really enjoys it. It's like a hobby almost. Yeah, which is great. I think that's awesome. You know, I yeah, appreciate yeah, that. And yeah, everyone's cool. so nice. And she to her, was you know? enthusiastic, man. She did I tell you this? We got out off the train at Penn Station and I was trying to twist their arm to just take shoot down to 23rd Street on the one train. And, you know, they're they're like a lot of the world right now, they're reading into all the New York stuff and they think it's a lot worse than it is. So they were f- afraid to get on the subway. So I was like, all right, we'll shoot down on an Uber or in a cab or whatever. Got upstairs at Madison Square Garden and mom ended up walking. She was like, she had a lot of pep in her step, man. She was like, no, let's just walk down to 23rd Street. It's not far. I said, no, we're going to go down. We'll pass FIT where Allie went to school and where Lilia was going to go. And then we're going to go. It's another five blocks. We're going to shoot down to 23rd. It's right on the tip of Chelsea. Then we're going to go down towards 9th Ave. It's right there, you know? And she walked the 11 blocks or whatever, you know, with vigor. I'm not sure she would do that for the other kids. Yeah, man, but she was. Not. Uh, she did it, and she did it. Uh, she she impressed me. So I was like, "Wow!" She so she was really she was energized. Good, yeah, day. good. And yeah, I appreciate so. everyone being nice to our parents, like our mom, and on the line stuff like that. If like I saw someone be mean to my mom on the line, I'd snap your fucking neck. <laughs> oh, Micah says she's they're off. They're so they're so awesome. You'll appreciate this. Micah says she's off to Lowe's. Our toilet bowl upstairs, like the stopper is like all fucked up where it's like leaking you know like it's like oh, doesn't stop sure. running yeah, or whatever yeah. what do you call it the flapper the flapper that's what it is yeah. and um sounds sexual doesn't it <laughs> and she was making me laugh so hard last night dude because she was like i'm gonna i'll go to lowe's you know mike is the man in the family in the in the uh in the relationship so she's okay, like i'll go to lowe's and i'll figure out how to fix this thing or whatever and i'm like oh i can go with you and she's like i don't need to be bringing my wife to lowe's she's so funny dude See, she still has a sense of humor about it where Helene is just frustrates the shit out of her. You know, she was at Home Depot last night getting stuff. Yeah. Like and she's just like, I, you know, she Helene's at the period now, 21 years where she kind of probably wishes that I was a little more um, useful when it comes to that stuff. But I have my lane. You know, yeah, I don't I don't them. I'm, I, I told her I'm like, I'm not fixing it. Like I was like, I'm not fixing this. So like. <laughs> You can do it or we'll like hire a task rabbit or something to come and do it. No, it? that's easy. You guys could handle that. That's easy. Like, even for me. I have had my hands in there like trying to fit. I'm not like grossed out by it, but it's like it's clean water anyway. But it's just, it's just like uh, and I was like trying to finagle it and like get it to sit properly. And it does. And then it works for like a few flushes and then it gets like j- jostled off again. And it's like the water just keeps running very slowly. So you're obviously paying yeah. like a higher water bill and it's just annoying. So that was like the extent of what I could do basically at that point. And at, the, at, at that point, I was like, listen, these are the two options. Like, this needs to be fixed tomorrow. I don't mind if you don't want to do it. But if you don't, then you need to go on TaskRabbit and get a plumber to come over here and fix it. Yeah. You know? And she was like, she just decided she would do it herself, which I appreciate. She's very handy. Like, she went to a machinist high school. You know, that's right. I always forget that. People, so she people, has she that. works in she worked in multiple factories, like doing like industrial factory work, basically assembly. Yeah, stuff. like 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 doing like I think one of them was like metallurgy, like with with uh she's talked about that. Yeah, with like um what why can't they were like chimneys and stuff like that and like metal thing, like you know, fabrication of those things. 
Yeah. Oh, like chimney brushes? No, like like the the the, the spiral top of like a you know, like oh, know on top of the brick or whatever. There'll be like sure. The, wow, that's what it was. So she has that skill set, three dimensional thinking, whatever. Yeah, she's smart. Solving. She's really like yeah. she's very very handy and like she, she grills in the backyard. She is the man. Like she was, and and we talk about it like that. She's like, oh, maybe I'll go get a get a new bag of uh, briquettes or whatever while I'm there. We, and I'm like, yeah, you got to get some more. Of your what she loves it, you know she's she's in, I'm really appreciative. She is both very domestic and very handy, like the ultimate nexus. The thing that she didn't that well, the thing that I've taken for granted in some sense because I never needed it, right, was a domestic person because I don't I don't mind cleaning. I have always cleaned my own space. I used to clean my room every week and shit like that when I was a kid. Like clean it like with dust and like dusting it and like doing all the, like and clean my own apartments and did all that kind of stuff. Did my own laundry since I was in middle school, cooked my own meals starting in college and became a decent cook. And so I was very used to doing all of those things. And she has disabled all of that in me where like, I don't do any of that anymore. And, but like, it's gotten to the point where it's like, Oh, if you don't want to clean, like I'll help you clean and like clean up and stuff like that. But I just don't want to do it. It's not that I think you have to do it. So it, you either can do it, or I'll just pay to have someone do it because I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah, but as long the, as you're having that conversation. Right, exactly. So it's Yeah, yeah. So she's but so she takes care of a lot of those things, especially cooking, which is awesome. And she loves cooking and she loves baking and all that stuff, which is like, damn, dude, this is this is very fortuitous and very lucky for me. But at the same time, it was not something I ever thought I'd even want because I was very self sufficient. Yeah, no, ways. I know what you mean. So I appreciate that. You know? I know what you mean, dude. Yeah. And then also plumbers out there though, why is toilet bowl technology still the same and you would say well if it's not broken mm-hmm. don't fix it but it is broken those flapper things are ridiculous why can't we come up with something like they, a, they break all the time like a mechanical thing chain. yeah i mean it's a moving part they i'm sure they do make those and they're probably just expensive you know that's all what the flapper itself well no like like you can imagine i was actually it's funny because i don't know anything about anything really like that's <laughs> useful you know I was watching a documentary on YouTube at like three in the morning last night about fucking the history of piracy. I mean, this is the kind of shit I'm interested in. Like, I don't know anything about how anything works. And so I just opened the toilet and I fucked around. With, usually I've had chains break. That's like the situation I've encountered chain, in my past. Yeah, and that's yeah. easy and I can fix that. But like I was opening it up and I was just looking at it and I'm like, this is so interesting. It's just like a totally analog machine based on buoyancy and water level. And yeah, I just kept watching just, it like a fucking five-year-old. I just kept like watching it. I was like, this is so weird. Like this thing activates at this point, but there's like no electronics. No. And I'm like, it's so brilliant. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just not broken. So there's nothing to fix. But I guarantee you, because it's just about the thing that like sets it up and then the water levels kind of adjust. There could be a small device that would do all of that for you. And I'm sure that they make those, but it's, yeah, they must, but it's like probably just like, why? Like, why do you? Right. Because if that breaks, that's a five hundred dollar replacement, as opposed to each of these yeah, components is expensive. like worthless, basically. It's yeah, it's mechanical. It's more expensive. That's completely analog. It's, it's the rising, and falling in the water. It, it, it's kind of brilliant. That and and I guess you got to kind of give it its give it its flowers that it's been around for so many decades, and that's just because it's functional. We got to bring back the thing. We remember we had like the we it wasn't connected, but we had the old toilet bowl in the downstairs how in marie court oh, the, the pull chain yeah like the pull we got to bring that back the pull chain one elevated tank yeah it's that's sick dude that's such a sick design like they probably still do make those for aesthetic reasons because they look weird really cool you would just have a bowl and a pipe going up to it yeah and that would be it that's actually, like why isn't that a better look than what we have now i think it's just it's just more compact and easier to install and cheaper and stuff the way we do it now but it's right. weird that like more opulent things like don't have actually the pull chain be kind of can be kind of neat. yeah that's actually a good point i always i cannot not think of the godfather when i think of that because that's where michael hides the gun right in the, in the italian restaurant right <laughs> that's so funny dude and they were what those tanks were wooden right yeah they were wooden was, and dad must have gotten one like daddy our dad used to bring home like random to our dad uh, used to just bring home random shit from fires yeah. and like antiques and abandoned yeah. yeah and like a lot of them were like he got like these amazing banisters from like the 1820s or so it's like some weird like i don't know what the what the fuck he ended up and i think i don't know if he what he did with some of that stuff i don't know if some of this stuff was incorporated in his new house because our, our dad kind of built his dream house in the hamptons hmm. um and i don't know if he was able to incorporate some of that stuff in there yeah i'm um, sure he has some stuff but um because he was like for years it's like the old joke of like why does your dad save like a 
like a huge box full of like wood scraps and shit. Like, but our dad was saving like real furniture and like real things that he would find. Yeah, um, dude. along the way, and he had so much yeah. shit. So, yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> let's talk about them more deeply. We've talked about them as a unit, and I don't really, I never really experienced them as a unit in my cognizance. So. We talked. We did an episode about the divorce and all that kind of stuff. I think it'll be mm. more fun to just talk about them as individuals and like who they are and how they are and what they've done and how they've influenced us and all those kinds of things. I think that would be a, a more effective way forward. I thought we would start with Dad. Um, what do you what do you have to say about our father, Jer- Jerry Moriarty, mm. Gerard Moriarty, seventy three years old, born nineteen fifty, um, high school graduate in the 60s joined the air force for a little while during vietnam never went over he was stationed in texas he was a mechanic and uh then he got out he did like a series of odd jobs our parents owned a fruit store and vegetable store for a couple of years on long island in the 70s um and he was like an iron worker. He worked on the World Trade Center. Yeah. Actually, which is interesting, full circle thing for him. And then ultimately he ended up a New York City firefighter, took the test, and ended up in the FDNY. And um these days, so in the nineties, in the mid nineties, our dad got hurt in a fire badly. He fell in a fire and fucked his hands up. And had to get like a series of surgeries that put him on light duty. This was the reason why he wasn't at 9-11. Um, like when it happened, he was there later that day, but he wasn't there with a lot of his firehouse, which was there uh, the on duty people. And that's, they died because they were able to hop over the bridge and get, get there quickly. So it's like, obviously the, the midtown downtown Brooklyn firehouses were wiped out, um, because of proximity to the, you know, if you were, if you were in like Queens or you were uptown there, you weren't even going to get to the scene in time for the collapses. So in a lot of weird ways, our dad's injury, and I think he's acknowledged this, and we've talked about this, is like saved his life in some weird way. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, Dig, but sure, yeah, um, I think about that constantly. And uh, so, while he was injured and on light duty and kind of on injury leave, he went back to school and got his bachelor's degree, and then got his grad degree in 2002 and can i tell you a bad memory i have yeah like it's about me and how i feel bad dad and i like had i it, it's so distant and i'm so foggy about these years now that like it's hard to remember exactly what it was like but dad and i didn't get along great in high school and it wasn't like that bad but it was somewhat hostile at times and i think we were just sick of each other and i think my interpretation of it was he was sick of I was I don't, it, it sounds like it's like I'm an anchor or whatever but like I'm an albatross like the other kids are gone you and Dana were already out right and Allie was basically out and I think dad was like ready to be done and I don't think dad had processed or had given been given the time or space to process a lot of what had even happened over the last decade mm. and so he graduated when I was a senior in high school he graduated with his graduate degree. I think it was at Stony Brook, right? Is that where he went? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and which is a great Good school, school on Long Island. Yeah. And a SUNY school. And so it's I couldn't the- get into I, Stony Brook rejected me actually when I graduated from high school. First school to actually reject. It's like, nope. <laughs> I experienced no rejection because I applied only to the school that mom went to and taught at. <laughs> um, <laughs> you would have been fine. I don't think I would have gotten into Northeastern without her, but you don't think I wouldn't get into the day. Like that's what people always say. They're like, because a lot of people like you went to Northeastern and I'm like, yeah, but, and it was a good school when I went there, but now it's like a considered a really, really prestigious school. And it really wasn't quite on that level when I went there yet. You know, it was building to that. Like we passed, we surpassed the hundred ranking when I was there. It was a big deal that they wanted to get to the top hundred schools in the United States. Okay. And then they did. And now they're like 30 or whatever. But like, Are they really? like when I was, yeah, because like, and there's all sorts of ways to manipulate the U.S. News and World Report too. It's not still that's high. Um, yeah, they're like in the 30s, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that's like, impressive. it looks a lot better that I like what people are like. That's where you went. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did go there. I mean, that's that is where I went, but it was it was like you know more of like a 90 or 100 on the rankings when I was there. So, um, 
a little bit different. But da- so anyway, dad graduated from Stony Brook. And I remember he wanted me to go to his graduation to take pictures and I didn't want to go. And he said something like, like it was like he was annoyed and disappointed and insulted that like I like we were our relationship was in a position where it's like I didn't even want to go. I ended up going and doing it and we had a nice time and took the pictures and went out to dinner and all that. But I feel like that was like a paradigm shifting moment for me with dad where I started seeing him as a person. You know, and I've I've remarked on this in the past that like I just out of ignorance and I think how good the people around me were of normalizing whatever situation I was in. I just never, ever thought about my parents' pain. Like what they felt like or what they cared about or like what they you were going through. Never, age. not once. Have, never thought about no it. There's no way. You, you don't have the wherewithal to do that yet at that Like age. I never like, yeah, like thir- seven, of course, but like even at 12 or 14, I wasn't like, huh, I wonder if mom and dad are like in pain. No, you can't do that yet. You know? Yeah. And it's, yeah. and I started seeing at that our relationship changed. I mean, you have to understand dad was hostile to me in some ways too. We tell we joke about it, but dad used to take my keyboard from my computer when he was mad at me or like, I did something wrong. He used to take my controllers away when I like did this and that. Like he used to needle me, you know, right. The way what was going to hurt you the most. Right. Right. Like with your skateboard. Right. Yeah. Where it's like I would go. It would like I would sit down at my computer and my mouse would be gone. Yeah. You know, and this is in 1998 where you, you just don't go and get a mouse on Amazon or go buy a mouse. I'm in ninth grade. You know, That's a good point. Yeah. And. Now, I'm not saying he would just do that to be a dickhead. I, he did that because I did something and it and it, like it created this. This tension, but I never really know if it was as bad as it seemed. I was also I played hockey. In high school and I was really self-destructive in those years in hockey, like I basically di- I didn't play my senior year because I was hurt, so I, it wasn't an option. But like, I, as I've said before, my coach died when I was in uh, 11th grade and we had a new coach come in who I had no patience for and was basically removed from that team, you know, like but at the end of the year being like, you either need to like figure your shit out or you're like not welcome here anymore. Like, and the funny thing is, as I've said before, the high school hockey wasn't even that serious. Like the high school I played in middle school was like way more serious. They, those teams would have beaten my high school team um, easily. So it wasn't like it was a very serious thing, but it was like where my mind was where like I I think because I think I like let up a goal and broke a stick or something like that, you know, like over the post after the game. Just I was so angry. And. I took a, a lot of it out. I wasn't a violent person like in real life. I was just in hockey. I was like a pretty vicious hockey player I, as a goalie, like. Hitting legs and punching and like just being an aggressive Ron Hextall style, Patrick <laughs> Waugh style, Martin Brodeur style goaltender. And I think dad was put off by that, too, because I don't think he understood where it was coming from because I didn't always play like that. You know, right. And I think I was just getting. I think we just had like so much dissonance between us. And. I don't know. I rem- I just remember the things that he would try to do to like find common ground with me. And I appreciate it in hindsight. Like one thing I always think about is how much he would watch MTV with me. And I think part of that was that dad low key loves music. I mean, and he even liked the stuff I was listening to. Some of it, Absolutely. some of it he would make fun of. I always say that I remember the band disturbed which, who I like. I still like that band disturbed, but you do you know them. They, uh, I don't know if I know that. You would definitely know their music, but like their singer is one of those guys, like his whole trademark is like making weird noises, like, ooh, ah, you know, like kind of okay. like I'm weird noises. You would definitely know them down with the sickness, all those kinds of songs you would know from back okay. in the day. And uh, I remember clear as day dad, I was in the car and a dad being like, these guys suck <laughs> like straight up. But often he would sit there and watch MTV with me and watch a hundred, even because he we stayed up late and like watch 120 minutes where I would record it. And um, just music videos on MTV two or whatever. And, you know, we tried to find balance and peace with each other. And I also always think about dad being the person who would buy all of these nerdy ass games for me, like that I asked for. Like dad bought me Tales of Destiny. Dad like went into GameStop and asked them for Tales of Destiny. Dad went into EB and was like, can I buy Brave Fencer Musashi for my my ninth grade son? Like. It's just so funny. The nerdiest, cool. the nerdiest, like stupidest shit. I was having like the weebiest proto weeb shit. I was having our dad do. Yeah, no, it was cool. And he was always, he was always patient 
uh, with me and decent to me. And I think we found a way to kind of survive together. And I think what we realized was how, how similar we are in a lot of, I mean, that's the way I kind of see it is in a lot of ways. I don't think the Apple Mike has remarked. This was she's like, from her like observation. She's like, the Apple didn't really fall very far from the tree with you and your dad. You know, like you seem to be the most like him out of the four of you in oh, a, lot of different, a lot of different ways in being like kind of wanting quiet, reserved, not saying too much, very political. Like that's where I, I get that shit from dad. Like I get my people like, where did you get your politics from dad? Like dad is the one who made me political. Yeah. Not intentionally. It's right. just that like when we would drive around, it's like, oh, um, Rush Limbaugh's on and I'm in fourth grade and or, you know, this this news radio is on or we're watching this thing or and our dad hates TV, actually, so he would never watch TV. But um, so anyway, I'm rambling on and on, but I just felt like I feel like we found some sort of equilibrium. And I've noted. That I was so I always wanted to make my dad proud or our dad proud of, of me, like if, for some reason, it, I knew. Our mom will be proud of me no matter what. I think my dad will love me no matter what. I don't know if he'll be proud of me no matter what, but I wanted to earn what I thought was a skeptical audience's pride in me, like in being a Moriarty and like doing something good in the world and having something. Um, and when I got my job at IGN, he said to me, I, I said it before that he like was like, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't just didn't understand mm. like what you were doing. And it meant so much to me. Cause I was like, I made it in dad's eyes. Like I made it, I showed him something he didn't know. Cause I, we bring up the story right about how our 486, our, our first computer from the nineties, like just broke when I was using it one day. I have no idea why I didn't do anything to it. And he really thought that I broke that computer. And then I think over time he realized like, oh, these are just machines that you interact with. They break for all sorts of different reasons. I've had problems with them too. It's the same thing with the internet. He had no idea. He knew I wanted to be on it and I was on it in 96, 97, 98, but he had no idea what I was doing or why I was doing it. And it seemed like an obsession and it all came together, I think, for him and been like, holy shit, this is actually, it worked. Like whatever he was doing worked. And he acknowledged and admitted it. And it was a really great moment for me. Something he probably doesn't remember at all, but something I'll never forget. So let me dish it over to you, Dig. I've said quite a bit there. I mean, we can go back and forth, but what do you have to say about that? What, give me some reflections. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I like hearing about your high school experience and kind of co-living with dad. Right, because it was him and me for four years alone. Yeah, just you guys, mm -hmm. you know, bosom buddies, like roommates mm -hmm. type of type of a deal. And I could say I have a little insight into this because I have teenagers now, and I have a seventeen year old, a newly minted seventeen year old. And high school, it's confirmed, right? Like high school kids and their parents, like that's the time of locking horns. Like it's not that wasn't just beholden to you and dad. That's a typical scenario. Right. It's and in fact, I think it's weird if it doesn't happen. Right. Because I think two things are going on there oftentimes. The kid as a 15, 16, 17 year old, even 18 year old and, and and late into their teens, they the kids don't lack, they don't, they they don't have yet an adult perspective. But oftentimes the parents' expectations are that they're gonna the kids, the teenage kids are gonna understand things like they understand things as grown adults. So the expectations don't align with the capability of the kid. And I think if the parent doesn't have empathy, like if they're, I really think the key is to remembering what it feels like to be 16. And if the parent doesn't, and the parent lacks that empathy, you're going to lock horns. You know what I mean? There's going to be, there's going to be butting of heads. And I'm not as great as mom and dad are. I could tell you that I never really saw that they, they were young parents too, which is ironic. I don't know that they always had that empathy where I learned from growing up with them to have that empathy. I think that's also in my nature because I'm just young at heart. So it's advantageous for me. Like I remember what it's like to be 16 and 17. You know, your whole MO is having fun. It's like, let me get through the homework. Let me get through the school day. Let me get to the weekend. Let me get through my shitty part-time job. So nine o'clock rolls around. I can hang out with my friends. I could go driving. I could play video games, whatever I'm going to do, go to the movie. It's all about, it's hedon, hedonism. You don't understand responsibility at that age. You don't understand. You just want to do the things you're engaged with. You want to hang out with your tribe. 
you want to be with your friends you want to do the things that your the hobbies that you're that you're currently you know your hobbies and your endeavors and all that kind of thing so it's an alignment of expectations and, and capabilities and i think that's why you what you were going through with dad and i do think that so a lot of that wasn't really your fault you know what i mean but i do like hearing that dad tried to engage with you and relate with you on things that you could find common ground on like music because the, our dad wasn't going to do it with sports. He wasn't going to do it with the computer. So he found something that a mutual interest. Right. When I and tried to, which is so cool. When I went to Islanders games, it was often our mom dated this guy, Mike for five years or something like that, like at the turn of the century. And he was a really nice guy. I liked him a lot. He was really like, it, it was who she dated before she found her Larry, her husband now 20 something years ago. And he was really, really sweet. And he lived on Long Island and he used to bring me to Islanders games. And that, that was, I went, I, I've, I went to a legendary playoff Islander playoff game in 2002 with him. And uh, dad was just not interested in that space. My whole exposure to the Islanders were through our old neighbors and going to games with them. Dad like went to a mm-hmm. game or two with us and then going with other friends and then watching it on my own. And I used to go across the street when I became a Jets fan in high school. I used to watch the Jets games with Mike Pope's dad every weekend. Right, right. That's, I remember you doing. Yeah, that. like I would literally go over there at one o'clock and just walk into the house and just like sit on the couch. His dad would be in the recliner. I'd sit on the couch and we would just walk because Mike didn't care either. Like Mike would have fit much better with our dad, and I would have fit much better with Skip Pope. You know, like in terms That's of like, which is like because because Mike loves being outside. Mike loves working with his hands and building things, and like you know, do, and like he would have that would have been like they would have been peas in the pod probably. You know, meanwhile Skip and I would be, you know watching sports and dicking around and playing golf and doing whatever, you know, like. Why can't you do that? Why can't kids and parents like, I don't want to call it swing because that sounds terrible, <laughs> but it's kind of like swing. A reverse swing. Yeah. Like, it's like, a, it's like a swing. Dude, I, I, I've said it before. Like the Pope's took, I, that's the thing of not really knowing or understanding what people are doing for you. Like they took care of me, you know, like, yeah, I used to eat dinner there all the people. time. They would, I would just like be able to, like I said, just walk into their house. Right. You know? And, and it wasn't weird at all. Like they were welcoming and it was fun. And that was like such a wonderful experience to have neighbors like that. You know, um, when you have, a, when you have no mom around and your dad is working all the time, you know, and gone, it's like, I was alone a lot. That's why I think yeah. I often think like, especially the girls like infantilize their children, like our sisters infantilize their children, but it's only because of like, why won't what, like, they're like in seventh grade. What the fuck are you talking about? But it's all through my weird lens of having w- literally watched myself after school since like fourth grade. You know, yeah, and just being alone POV. Yeah. and being like, dad would leave me alone on the weekends in high school. Yeah. You say that to me sometimes. Yeah. So like, why can't the kids stay? Yeah. Home? I'm like, what are you talking about? I was in like 10th grade and dad would like go see his weird girlfriend upstate. You know? Yeah. You had a very specific reality with that. But the swapping thing. Yeah. And, the, and those people like the Popes for you or the Cotchers, you know, for me, PJ's family, you have those key figures in your life that really take up a prominent role in helping to raise you and giving you a quality of life and we and wanted a nuclear speak. experience i wanted that i knew it yeah. in my in me right. i needed it and they were and a nuclear yes, family but, and i wanted to be in it i wanted to be one of them you know yep and you kind of were yeah and they knew and it got, too like that was the thing about them is that they knew it that's what i that's why i appreciate that so much mm, they knew it yep you know that they were they were like serving some role over the years for me that's an interesting point yeah but they loved you and they appreciated yeah. you. They wanted to They do still it, write letters yeah, they, to me and we still talk like to this day, you know? Yeah, that's um, cool. Like they were like a mom and dad to me. I mean, it brings tears to my eyes because they were so sweet to me and yeah, they didn't have to do that. They weren't like rich. They owned like a small electric electronics like installer. Oh, right. You remember? Yeah, yeah. Packy Electronics. Yeah. And they weren't rich by any stretch of the imagination. I would eat them at a house and home. Yeah. Yeah, that's like that's like, like they, I would go, they would it would be like her his mom would flow be like Colin did you eat the fucking onion bagel or whatever that was in there I'd be like yeah I'm sorry I thought it was just like you know there I'd leave them notes on their whiteboard in their kitchen I'd put like ridiculous items on their shopping list for their grocery store and like things like that it was just funny you know it was just it is interesting I wanted though, that, that so they, bad you know yeah and you got it I was gonna say through osmosis but it really wasn't you become like an honorary member of the family yeah that's the way I felt yeah. Yeah, and they knew it, and they acknowledged it, and they they knew they were doing some sort of service, if you will. But yeah, that who knows that that was uh you know I credit that in my scenario with you know survival. Like who knows how it would have turned out if that if I didn't have those people stepping in, mm. you know, to the point of you know like, oh, wow, like was I even worthy of that? 
But with dad, it's interesting, Kyle, because there's a dad that I know that I think it's a, it's 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 a funny kind of setup because I think there's a dad that I know, our dad, post Colin, then there's the dad that I knew the 10 or 11 years before you came into the world, right? And for the dad that I knew as a kid was kind of the same dad in some ways, right? It was man a few words, always very busy, always very active, never dormant, never idle, you know, never sitting down, very hardworking, definitely a, a quiet wisdom you know, the strong silent type for sure. hundred percent. Like that's, those are my earliest memories of dad. Also sort of a model of masculinity before I knew how to articulate that, Very, you know, big, a, you know, a big man and physical, physical size, tall, rugged, right. Um, would pick me up and hug me and sort of rub me against his face. He always mm-hmm. had the five o'clock shadow that was really coarse, you know, like sandpaper but I feel like that dad that I knew early on led by example. Like he wasn't sitting down demonstratively teaching me things. I was observing him. And I do remember studying him. Now, dad worked a lot. You know what I mean? He was a firefighter. But, you know, when I was born, I guess he was still an iron worker. So working on the World Trade Center. Ironically, he worked on Starrett City which is like a, a housing complex in East New York, which is kind of ironic because that's where he, East New York is where he ended up working almost his entire career as a firefighter. So my earliest memories of dad in the seventies, he was already on the job, right? He was already a firefighter professionally. So on the job, John, sorry, I had to do the, the, the <laughs> on the, the job, <laughs> <laughs> on the job. <laughs> But he was already gone two or three day tours. So he wasn't around a lot. So he moved in and out of our lives like Gandalf. You know what I mean? So he was, it was a it was more of a fascination. I was observing him, I was studying him, but he he wasn't always around. But I think the notion of him not being around only encouraged my curiosity and my wonder. Because when he was around, I was catching up and doing my due diligence to say what, you know, to see what's this guy all about. Like I understood he was my dad. I understood all of those things, but because I only had him, let's say, half the time, there was a fascination. You know, I put him up on a pedestal, and that was the first 10 or 12 years of my life, you know, of kind of worshiping him from afar. You know what I mean? Already recognizing the work ethic before I knew how to put that in words. Already, you know, recognizing the fact of, you know, what he embodied, what he was good at, what he was interested in, the types of music he listened to, um, looking through a car magazine, working in the garage, his work, he had a little workshop set up in the garage and he had another little workbench shop set up in the basement, always doing something outside, never sitting around, not a, not a golfer, didn't hang out with the boys drinking and smoking a cigar. If he ever sat down with a cocktail, it was with mom after dinner. But everything about him, I was ingesting. You know what I mean? I was taking in because he was, uh, I didn't really know him like I knew mom. I didn't really even know him like the people I would see weekly, like grandma, grandpa, our aunts, our uncle Mike. I felt like he was the closest person to me that I was still trying to get to know until in my adolescence, really, where it started to change, which I guess was a, a case of him getting promoted at work, dialing down the side jobs, so was around a little more because he was making more money. And then I'm not sure if partially it was because mom was in his ear about you need to spend more time with Dagan or what, but because dad wasn't the type, like dad really had no interest in sports. I don't remember ever having a catch with him or anything like that. Now, I do remember spending time with mom and dad on plenty of occasions with the family. So with Dana, with Allie and Toe, as a family going to a uh, firefighter's picnic or the Christmas party at the firehouse or to the beach, a couple of trips to Disney World, other vacations up to New England. Um, I remember camping trips. Being, you know, very early, like probably the camping trips probably subsided by the time I was seven or eight, you know, going up to Pennsylvania on the Delaware with Uncle Frank and our cousin Matt for the weekend to go camping and ride the rapids, that sort of thing. But there was never one-on-one time that I remember with dad. I remember him not 
being around to just have a catch with me on the front lawn. I don't remember him at my little league games. So mom might have got in his ear by the time I was 12, 13 to say, you need to spend more time with Dagan. The only time he had was when he was moonlighting on the weekends doing his little various side jobs. So he would have me in tow going to build a deck or going to, right? So I would be with him in his pickup truck going to work on some sort, one of his little side gigs, gigs, one of his little side hustles. And he couldn't teach me how to throw a curveball. He couldn't teach me how to throw, you know, shoot a three pointer. So, but he could teach me hammer and nails, carpentry, woodworking, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's what he did. He, that's the only time he had when he wasn't commuting back and forth to Brooklyn. So if he had a little side job out east on the island, I would be his little sidekick. You know what I mean? I would ride shotgun and spend the day. And I think it was more frustrating for him because I was bored and I wasn't really interested. And I'm not sure even how much time he had to teach because he had to get this whole thing done. He was building a little deck for a little old lady. He had 48 hours to do it before he hustled back into Brooklyn on a Sunday night. So, But he tried. That was the first time I ever remember spending time with just dad outside the family. And again, it wasn't that he didn't spend time with us as a family. I do remember that. And sometimes just going out as a family to grandma's for Sunday dinner, spending holidays together, stuff like that. He was around. I think it's it's unfair to say that he wasn't he was never around. Like I do remember spending time with him. But it was just never one-on-one when I was a kid. And if it was, I have no memory of it, you know. The other thing I re- I remember lamenting about him was when he was around wanting it to last. You know, really wanting him to stay. And that there were times where he would leave by four o'clock on Christmas. So he would wake up with us, have presents, we'd have breakfast, he'd have his coffee. He could sort of hang out for a little bit, but then he was out because he had to be at work. He was on the job. His his shift started at five or whatever. He had to shoot into the city. So you know, we would have him for half a holiday sometimes. And I hated it. I hated to see him leave. I felt, I remember, I don't know if it was that I was the oldest or that I was an anxious kid or I was particularly, um, I don't want to say, I mean, I was a sensitive kid, you know what I mean? So I was really in tune with things that I probably shouldn't been in tune with, but I remember feeling safer when he was home. You know what I mean? Like I would worry about people breaking into the house when I was seven years old if mom was home alone for a night or two. You know what I mean? When he was around, I didn't have to worry about that. You know, I felt interesting. I felt this protection, this safety. You're no longer on watch, stand down night. (laughs) You know what it was, dude? I'll tell you exactly what it was. It was those made for TV late night movies about like the stalker. Oh, sure. Or about the, you know, the rot, the, the, you know, the burglars or this or that, you know, the Hill Street Blues episodes or whatever. But yeah, I, I remember wanting him around and I remember wanting to get to know him. And I think also there was a little bit of fear. You know what I mean? Like he was big, he was physically imposing. You know, I remember his, his hands always seemed so big to me. You know what I mean? Up to my little nine year old hand, even, you know what I mean? Like he was a big guy, six three, and he was, he was fit and yeah, he kind of, he, he casted this picture of masculinity, what I thought it would like be like to be a man, right? He was out chopping wood, building things, fixing the car, right? That kind of thing. But beyond that also, like, I guess it's the difference of like being a little boy and being like, oh, is that, you know, is that what I'm going to be like in the future? And how do I, how do I get there? And like that, that sort of fascination and that sense of wonder with it, you know, but, and also realizing like now having a son, like the apple doesn't, yeah, the, in a lot of ways, the apple fell closer to the tree, but I'm not dad and my son's not me. You know what I mean? That type of thing. So it's, and, but he, oh, that's the other thing I wanted to say about dad. He always put up I wanted to talk to you about this. He never, there was never this push for the whole, it's going to be Jerry and Sons bit. Now, he didn't own a business. So there wasn't ever that aspect of, you're going to take over the family business, son. It's already set in stone. Like, this is your future type of thing. But there was never that junior mentality. Like, Dagan, the individual, or Dana, or Allie, or Colin, the individual, 
that was always very pushed and encouraged. It was like blaze your own trail, find your own interest. What are you passionate about? Doesn't matter what it is, go out and get it. You know, and and it was never even like you're going to be a fire, you're going to be a firefighter. You know what I mean? And I think dad, one thing he didn't have, he wasn't saddled with that from his dad. I think his dad made a lot of mistakes, but that that wasn't one of the things his dad saddled him with. Where it's like you're going to take over the family business, or you're going to do this. I'm not going to push you in this direction, whether it was a trade or college. Dad was always there. Was always this. It wasn't laissez faire. It was a. It was a very decisive sentiment of, you're going to strike your own path in this world. You know what I mean? What do do you? That's so you know, interesting. You say that because I feel that totally. I think it's it's evident in the outcome of the four kids and what we decided to do. And it's no disrespect to any of us, but it's like none of us did anything that really made any economic or commercial sense at all. And you could just tell that that's a product. That's not an, that's not an accident. That's a pattern and a product of parents really, I think dad was really, and he could, he could correct us, but was really aware of you do whatever you want, but you definitely don't want to be doing this. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I don't think it was about firefighting or it was about carpentry or any of that kind of stuff. I think it was just like, you don't want to work like this. So find something that you love and see if you can't make a go of that. I wish I was able to do that. And I think that that's where, you know, our dad's a very literary person. Our dad's a very well-read, creative, interested person. He loves film and and literature and and. He has, he, he, and our mom too, like they're they're very creative people, but they weren't really able to pursue it. It was a different time where it's like, you would do what's practical and you have to go to the military and you have to fucking, you know, make money immediately for your wife and your young family. And there's no time to think, and there's no time to do anything. And I think that he worked really hard and that imbibed in us a work ethic that I think is inborn in us. Um, That's why I just don't think like we're doing this on a Saturday. Not that it's a big deal. It's a podcast, but it's like, I don't even think about working on Saturdays. But I know certain people we work with, and that's fine, or like put off by doing anything on a weekend. You know, it's like that's so strange to me. I'll work whenever I have to. I work every day oh, of the week. You know, like I'll be on, I'll be up my emails ass later today and tomorrow, and like trying to figure out all these stupid things about accounting and all that. I'm just, but that's like I think that comes from dad. I think that that was a a low key thing. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I think what he wanted us to do was to just find a better path. And so when you have a son that's like an animator and a daughter that goes to school for English and a daughter that goes to school for fashion design and then package design and all that kind of stuff. And then a son that goes to school for history. I mean, obviously we all found our paths pretty independently. No one was in, uh, and I, I did take that for granted. No one ever once said like, Oh, did you now? I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but no one ever was like, did you ever think about like what you're actually going to do? Like what with like that history degree? Like, what are you going to do with it? And to me, I was like, oh, I'm going to be on a fucking history channel. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be a professor dude. or something. And, but it was, it was nonsense. Like I, I would have liked, th- they are the product of their upbringing. Yes. And I think, so I think the advice they gave us is good, but I think the advice kids should get now is something more like, you don't have to go to college. You might not want to go to college you should think very carefully about the debt you're undertaking and what you're going to do at the end of the road. If you're not old enough to understand that or, or mature enough to understand that, that's totally fine. Don't go to college. <laughs> you know, um, no one ever just told me that I was making, you know, financial mistakes or doing any of those kinds of things by getting involved in that. They were just like, just go and you'll figure yes. it out. And there is something to that, but I think it's a little dangerous today too. So I think it, it fit in that pocket. But I, if I have kids, I definitely am not going to do what our parents did. Like I am, I am going to be like, you should follow your passion, but consider the reality. Like, I'm going to talk to you like an adult when you're 16 and be like, you know, yeah, go be an artist if you want, but just understand what that means. You know, like that it has real practical negative underpinnings for your life. Yeah. They, you know, if you want to be and it's like, if you want to be rich or you want to be secure, become an engineer or do something like that or like go into science in some way or go into, you know, I don't know. But even then the robots will be doing those jobs soon too. <laughs> That's true. I'm We're not going to raise my kid and be like, you can be a podcaster too. Do you have any idea the dice rolls I hit to get here? 
Right. Like, just take skill and market aside. Just the luck, sheer luck. Luck plays a part, man. Huge. And I would never oh. put a person in that position because I would never make that role if I didn't know any better. Like I was too stupid to know. Maybe that's part of the advantage, though. You I know? think it could be. You know, to me, their encouragement always translated to, well, why can't you be successful as an animator? Just work hard. Is that what you want? Is that your passion? Now, it could have been total ignorance because they didn't really know what going going into the entertainment industry meant. But they never once said, all right, animation, fine. But what are you going to fall back on? Not once. Now, what you're, and, and sort of what you're saying, you know, how you want to pitch it to your kids in the future if you have them, right? But I think that's what I always took. It was like, it, it's a no brainer. Like, this is what I want. They, I guess, if you want to call it fortunate, they were fortunate in that I was 100% about it. Like, I had, there was no quit in me. You know what I mean? And that, that there was like, there was a sense of competition, finally finding something I'm good at having a footing, believing in myself, but that all stems from them. Not only them, grandma and grandpa and my other and the other people in my sphere as well, but especially mom and dad. But that's what it always translated to me as. You know, the, I always got that of like they have complete confidence in me. Why shouldn't I now? And it might have not that might have only been what it looked like to me cosmetically, but that it was fortunate and that's how I read it. So but yeah, they never did that once. And they were always just about like just find your lane and what you what you enjoy and the money will follow and it was never this type of thing of we're forcing ideas on you or you know the only person who did that in my life jokingly was grandma you know she would say what do you want to grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer like that's that's what she would say to me all the time but it was more of, of a playful thing i think you know it was a joke they never, there was never the family business thing. There was never going to this high paying career. There was never, it was always just like, what do you, what do you want? You know, what do you want to be and do that thing? I also wonder about it though, too. Like mom and dad are both much more educated now than they, than they were when they were raising kids, especially little kids. You know, they were both high school educated and that was it back then. So I don't think they, plus they were very young parents. You know, they had me when they were 22 years old. So when I think back to a high school, Colin engaging with a dad of that age, I'm engaging with a teenager that age, te almost 10 years after dad was. So dad was in his late thirties, early forties engaging with a 16 year old. I, I was almost 50, right? So he had so they there there was a there was a youth aspect to them raising kids, but also how much worldly knowledge did they really have? You know, the, like you said, they only had what they inherited from their upbringing and their youth and their parent, respective parents. So I always think of that too. Now, mom and dad are much more highly educated. They got their educations as adults. They went into different careers both very successful, especially, especially dad. He found his footing financially after many decades and so happy for him. But I was raised by different people. You know, I would, I would argue that we all were, but especially, you know, the early ones, Dana and I, and to some degree, Allie, like it was they, just completely two different people. But you know what they always had, Kyle? That, that this is the thing that I realize: whether you're a parent, not a parent, single, a spouse, married for 20 years, engaged, whatever. We're all going to make mistakes in life no matter what, right? But their mom and dad are both very introspective people. When you tell the story about dad apologizing years later about blaming you for the computer, that's an introspection that not a lot of people have. I would argue not a lot of people are able to look back at their mistakes and correct themselves and improve vis-a-vis -vis sort of saying, okay, let me learn from my misdeeds or how, how I acted or how I could have done this better. They both have that, especially dad. And I think that was something that was passed on to me too. You know, where I can make a mistake, but I'm going to apologize. Me too. For it. I'm the same way. And you realize there's not a lot. Do you have the same thing like takeaway as being an adult now and, and having this wisdom and experience? Like there's not that many people that could do that. No, I, I get annoyed by certain gift. I get annoyed by certain people I encounter or people in my life that are unable to apologize or like unable it. to 
acknowledge they're wrong. Like I, I feel like there's a cosmic balance that everyone needs to kind of tend to. And you either, every one of you is like the shepherd of this thing or like the farmer of this land. And you have to just in good, like in the, in the spirit of honesty, just be like, yes, I am wrong. And it brings like balance to it, you know? And then you hopefully will be the recipient of the similar treatment. If you are wronged or someone's wrong about you or says something wrong or does something wrong, whatever the, the case might be. So I, I find myself very similar. I'm, if anything, I'm probably, I'm, it's funny because a lot of people look at me as a very competitive person, but I'm really not. I hate conflict in my, in my life. And I often will jump on grenades that are not even my fault in order to just get past things, you know, because I don't want to deal with like the lingering nature of it. It's just like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm clearly not wrong here. I clearly didn't do anything wrong, but okay. Fair. And like, whatever, like, let's just normalize relations again or whatever and, and get through this. So yeah, I'm a bit of a peacemaker in that way. And I think that, yeah, it's just important. To, I think, I hope people listening take that in. It's like, it is important to acknowledge when you, um, when you, your own foibles are like, there's just no balance or honesty in the way you uh, interact with people. It's just, it fucking annoys me, you know? So, well, when you could soul search and go back and inspect and really look at yourself, really analyze, and I'm not saying you have to get in there all deep and hardcore, but like, you know what I mean? Like if you could go back and just say, how did I handle this? Let me do a little postmortem here. Did I handle this the right way? Did I say the right things? And then if you could on, take an honest look at yourself and just assess yourself every so often, that's, that's real self-improvement. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to get on a soapbox about people that can't say sorry, but that's where sorry comes from when you're able to do that. And mom and dad are both very good at that. Like that was something that I was always taught. And especially for somebody like me, who I think could be very emotional, that's a very important quality to have because I make a lot of mistakes, man, whether it's my interactions with people or the way I handle a situation or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So being able to really be introspective and therefore Sometimes I, I'm introspective and I say, all right, I handled that the best I could at the time I, with the resources I had. And sometimes I'm like, I completely fucked that up. But I'm, then I'm able to go back and address it to the people that were involved and say, you know what? I, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Um, I should have done this when you asked. I think that's why I'm still married after 22 years. It's not that I'm an easy person. It's just that I could say when I'm wrong. And they were always very, they were the, the emotional... I think the emotional qualities that they imparted were one of the most important lessons that they taught. And it it's kind of amazing that they couldn't work it out given that they both had those tools. Mm. Like they couldn't work it out together in their own mm. marriage, especially remembering how tight they were. You know what I mean? How what kind of friends they were. And um that's the mysterious thing about their breakup cuz I didn't learn that out of the ether. You know what I mean? They taught me that. So, and I think they, the, with those tools, I have a very strong marriage. Now, I also have a wife who has a lot of great qualities and and patience, and I think really loves me. You know what I mean? Like, really loves me for me, like mistakes and all, but you know, blemishes and and scars and all. But that's the thing too. It's like, what happened there? You know what I mean? Like they they they're the ones that showed me this. You know? Yeah. Do you feel the same way? Did they? I mean, I, I really love that story about dad and the computer and saying, you know what I mean? I kind of acted the fool with that. Yeah. It was just, it's just a little moments that you just, <laughs> amongst a million moments that you remember because of those. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that meant something to me. Cause I was like, yeah, that, that sucked to be kind of, I wasn't in trouble, but I know you blamed me for that. Like, I know you think I did something and I really didn't. And yeah, you do kind of carry that with you. It's like, I don't know any, I, I you're the one who doesn't know anything about fucking computers. Why, why do you think this kind of thing, you know? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it's a really great point. The, like they, they were not able to practice what they preached in some way. And that I think just suggests there being so much we don't know or understand. Yeah. There was you know? some I, like, I just, yeah, I don't even, I don't even, I don't even know if I want to know, not because I think it's like necessarily this bad thing, but it's like, do I really need like the ins and outs of how you arrived at this this heart wrenching situation. So yeah, it is interesting that like though they they imbued us with this certain quality, they uh, they were not able to kind of like execute on it when it mattered most. Or maybe it was beyond that. I don't know. You know, 
So yeah, some bre- yeah some bre- inexplicable breaking point that can't even be described. It, that, that's really kind of personal because only they could really understand it. Even though I was around for a lot of it, I was little for a lot of it. You know what I mean? There's stuff that you can't. You know, there is who knows. Like there's only there's a stress point for everything, right? Including every relationship. So who who the hell knows? My situation is completely different than theirs. But my marriage also, I think, lasted longer now, which is interesting. I think I broke that, right? It will be 22 years this year. Yeah. So I don't think they, they made it that far. No. That's interesting. They, they made it right. tw- 20 years, 19 years, something like that? About 20, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah. As, so as far as dad is concerned, like I just, I think he's a, a truly wonderful, stoic, interesting person. I think I've turned out a little bit like him and not in, in maybe our interests or anything like that. We have almost no intersections with interests, which is funny, like except for like some entertainment (laughs) and things of this nature and politics, obviously. But, but um, in terms of like the finer qualities, I think that, yeah, like I think that you kind of passively observe just workaholism and then you become that. And all I'll say is that like my life is nowhere near as difficult as my dad's was. <clears throat> and not even close. And it's so different working three day tours or doing all these side jobs and this and that, and being the fucking produce manager at a supermarket and doing all these things he was doing all at the same time. While I'm basically just like, I have to play a lot of video games and then talk about them in front of a microphone. It's work. It's hard. It's annoying. It's difficult. It's not something everyone can do, but it's not that. And so I want to acknowledge that, that like, yeah, I was able to kind of, and I think it's, I'm in the pocket that he kind of wanted. It's like, work hard on something you care about. Don't work hard on something that you don't care about. I'm not saying my, our dad didn't want to be a fireman or anything like that. I, I, he loved that job and he lo- and he still works for the FDNY today, but it's like. And he was good at it. Yeah. And he was, and he was really good at it, but he, but I think I understand what he's saying. It's like, it's not, I think in his ideal world, like he understood that you could reach some sort of ideal position of doing something you want to do. Like you don't have to, you actually don't have to sacrifice at the altar of capitalism and just fall into this pit if you don't want to, or if you can avoid it, you know? And I think that's powerful because it's true. It really is true. It's almost like he was, you know what? It's so weird, man. I never thought about this before, but yeah, I, he always said that to me too. And you know, the takeaway is, you know, was labor in, or toil in and money out. Like you don't need to do it like this. There's a better way. You know, it was a lot of work and scraping a living together for not enough takeaway, right? That was always the lesson. But it was almost like he was foreshadowing what was going to happen. Like the fact of like whether his workaholism or working too much or just being away too much, which led to the breakup and led to the family splitting apart, right? That it was almost like you don't need to do it like this. It's too problematic. It's too potentially problematic. It's not going to end well, type of thing. I never really thought of that before. And now he didn't know for sure. He didn't have a crystal ball for sure. But maybe the writing was a little bit on the wall when he said those things, or he worried about it. You know, he worried about it ending that way, or the, you know, the fact of at least being around more and making more money and being, you know, maybe working in a a forty hour a week job for a higher takeaway, a higher wage. That's not going to hurt a marriage, right? Certainly. So compared to what he was doing, which was trying to fill in the gaps with side jobs and working four and five jobs at a time sometimes. But shouldn't the question be asked too, like why, why? Mm. You know, like why did you have to do so much? And like why... So like we lived in a middle class neighborhood, nice middle class neighborhood in Medford. Why did we have to move to Marie Court? Like why did you keep putting yourself in those positions? I feel like there is something psychological there with dad where it's like you always have to strive to do more and maximize yourself. In other words, this your standard dad's standard body at rest is working all the time. So like, right. what is that going to go into? Okay, well, well, now we can afford this. So do I either stop working all the time or do we move on to the next thing that we have to strive to afford? Okay, I'm going to, the, fr- the the constant is me working. And I, I think that dad probably baked that in. I could see one of the things that I think I, I personally absorbed from dad is like this need for like strident independence. Like you have to be 
independent and live your own life and be on your own. And I actually think dad loves that shit probably to the maximal extent extent. Like I think dad likes being alone. I think dad likes working. I think dad likes being with himself. I think dad likes being with his thoughts. I think dad likes doing his own thing. And I think that there must be something to that of being like, I understand he worked hard because he had to, but like, why were none of our contemporaries parents doing that? Yeah. Like he was kind of trying to keep up with the Joneses, but where were the Joneses? Right. Like, like, wouldn't we have been just as happy in Medford? Maybe not, you know, but like, and we obviously have great memories of the Marie Courthouse. I'm not asking for any of those things to change. It's just like, why, when you reach that point, was it like we, something has to give here and we, and we need like to extend ourselves again, assuming like things were so financially perilous. It's like, you're kind of choosing that after a point. I'm not saying you stay in the Nassau County, one bedroom or two bedroom house you lived in. That was like really small, but here you can make it work or you don't have to extend yourself that much. That's the one thing I've never really asked them about is like, what's that all about? Because yeah, that dude, that's an interesting, I think that's an interesting point. Like none of my parents, listen, uh, my, my parent, my friend's parents were all interesting people. All, some of them were weird. Some of them were great, whatever. But none of them were just gone forever, you know, like or like off and like, oh, and like that things were we always need like this constant churn of capital. They were right. present, you know, at some point. And uh, I'm glad that I grew up with a dad that was later that was very present, you know, but it's 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 interesting to me. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, that's just an interesting thing to me. You know, dude, it makes complete sense. And yeah, like where was the ambition stemming from? I'll tell you, too, from my perspective of being a kid. There was a thing of lashing out against materialism while pursuing these things too. Like if you think of moving out east when Dana was two and I was four and moving into the bigger house. Now they were in a new house built in 77 or 78, 22, really nice 2200 square foot colonial, brand new, drove, eventually drove a couple of Mazdas, right? Everything's on the up and up, middle class, fine, right? But the ambition said, okay, we need the 4,500 square foot house on the acre of land in a much nicer area near the water. Let's get some better cars, you know, that type of thing. But here's the thing from my optics, and maybe this is, maybe I just wasn't seeing it, but dad wasn't living in the 2,200 square foot house with a group of friends that had 6,000 square foot houses and three BMWs in the driveway. Like, I could see that sort of keeping up with the Joneses peer pressure thing of like, oh, I have to have what my friends have. But I there there that didn't exist. It's almost like from my from the outside looking in, it's almost like that existed in their heads. You know, and I we gotta get that we have the house with the above ground pool, we need the house with the beautiful built in pool, right? And in the on a on a bigger piece of land in a more desirable neighborhood. And there was this ambition. Which a lot of people like some like outsiders like Helene, I'm saying outsiders to Long Island, they look at Long Island like that is the epitome of keeping up with the Joneses. That's that's the take of Long Island. It's like I feel like everybody I've met in my life being off Long Island now for 30 years, everyone I meet meets their first Long Islander when they go to college. Oh, I knew somebody from Long Island that was my college roommate. Ninety percent of people I meet, the first Long Island that they meet is in college because it's their roommate. Whether they go to school upstate or across the country or in the Midwest or the South, it doesn't matter. So, and the takeaway from Long Island is that's the place. It's like a little bit of what people think of the Jersey Shore. I'm t- I'm talking about what's her name, Snooky, Snooky, yeah. the fuck her name is, and the Hamptons. You know what I mean? That's the overall take on Long Island and like the Jewish American princess and the whole thing, the whole stereotype, right? Or as we call them, Japs. <laughs> Jappy. But mom and dad- <laughs> the, 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 the word, people would say it's, someone's being Jappy. I haven't heard that in quite some Me time. Me neither. I don't know if that's, I don't I think that's I feel like it's very provincial. Yeah, it is like, very, it, yeah, it is very provincial. Yeah. Right. Like, oh my a, God, she's so very, Jappy. <laughs> women would say that about other women it's so funny you say that too like you do it it's in your heads it's like why i really feel this way about women getting plastic surgery like mm. no one wants you to look like that you look like a fucking space alien this is all Agreed. this is all like in you're doing it for other women and in your head no man wants you to look like that 100 percent. yeah yeah same thing. 100 yeah. percent. that's a good comparison yeah yeah, yeah it's this it's it was this drive and i don't know you know i wonder 
it is funny. It is ironic as close as we are to dad that we've never had this conversation with him. And I'm not really afraid to engage with him on these type of things either. I should be clear about that. I just don't know for sure. I don't know how pleasant of a topic it would be for him to discuss, but I do wonder how much of what dad did and the level of his ambition and how far he got. And listen, he only got further in his 50s and 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, right? Like dad's doing really well for himself. Yeah, dad's doing all. I mean, dad's in a I'm position blessed. I never would imagine. I mean, it's awesome. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. All hard work and, so and all charisma, you know? Yeah, 100%. That's that's a great point. Mm. But I wonder how much of it is a fuck you to the old man. Mm. You know what I mean? Like he didn't have the best relationship with his dad. And I think his dad made a lot of mistakes. I don't want to talk too bad about Poppy. But because I don't want to offend the family. I barely I knew I barely ones. knew him, you know, so. I didn't really know him that well either. Yeah. But I do know that it was very, you know, it was polite. It was very surface level. We saw them on holidays. I think dad was a very loyal son. I think he was very respectful. But I think there was always that thing of, I'm going to prove it to you. And I wonder how much of it was fueled by that. I wonder how much of it was fueled by, I'm going to show my father that I'm not a loser. I don't know why dad would even be perceived that way because that work ethic, the intelligence, the wisdom, the work ethic, the fairness, um, the grit, like he, he, dad was born with those things. You know what I mean? Like those are things that are woven into your fabric. You don't learn that shit. So I'm not sure why he would have ever been a disappointment or a black sheep in that family. It's a, it's, it's confusing to me. I say to that family, I think specifically to Poppy, I don't want to put our aunts and uncle in that category. Um, but I do wonder how much of that ambition was fueled by that. And I wonder if Let's take away this point for mm. a second, Kyle. You ever thought of this? Mm. Mom and dad stay together. Was the house in Brookhaven Hamlet going to be enough? What was the next step? Yeah, on? I would imagine that the intent was that it would be, and then it wouldn't ultimately not have been. Yeah. Mm. But I think that the intent there was like that was another. where we would stay. And then you, because how, how could you not be drawn further east and further into opulence if you can push yourself and if dad needs to sustain that level of ambition? I think you're totally right. I love that word too. It reminds me of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, ambition. Like you see that word every five seconds in those games. They're books. I've never read the books, but um, but it is ambition. It is ambition, and and that's good because I'm ambitious too. And it's it's. I wonder if I get that from him as well. Like I think that that is one of my defining traits. Is for some reason I just can't stop wanting to figure out how to m make more money doing something, you know, like or become more secure. It's like a very so I can relate to it, but I'm not. I'm doing it just solo, not with a family in tow, which is a very huge advantage. See, dad would look at saying like, look at you, like you are living a comic book life basically compared to what I, I, I was living. And it's true, but that allowed me to kind of, I guess, hone that ambition in a direction where there were no passengers, right? So no, there was no one there to benefit or suffer except for me. And now I have a wife. So it's like, you do have a family now. Right. So now I have to think about it now. Yeah. But I'm in a good position. So I think that that's an advantage like for me, like that, that he didn't have certainly. And I also appreciate that. It's funny, like you're right. Why do sons want to be like their dads, better than their dads, prove something to their dads, depending on the situation they had with their father? I think you're totally right about dad because I feel the same way about dad, except for it's not like proving anything. It's just making him proud, like being... Mm. As opposed to being like, because I think maybe, I don't know for sure, but it's like maybe his dad was like, you're, you, you're not going to do shit, right? So it's like he proved it, but my dad didn't say that to me. No. So like, it's just like you want your dad there for, so I have nothing to prove on that front. My dad never told me I wasn't going to amount to anything. My dad told me I was going to be great, you know, um, and I appreciate that about him. And uh, so you just want to make him proud and that, but I want to be like him too. You want to emulate him. And for some reason... <clears throat> We castigate the workaholism, but we both are workaholics, especially oh, 100%. you, you know, and I, I was that. as bad as you for a while in my life. I'm not, it's bad. I'm not that bad anymore. And like, there is something about being like, oh yeah, like this is just what we do. And then we never really ask ourselves why, like you obviously have to use an Italianism, like a nut that you need, right? With your money. Right. And right. it's like, you actually have flexibility there. Probably you just choose to say like, this is the reality and this is how I have to work in order to fulfill that. It's kind of the similar thing dad was doing. And I do the same thing, you know, Yeah. where it's just 100%. like, oh, 
um, you have this, this, and this, when is it going to be enough? And it's like, it'll never be enough. So don't even, I talked about that with like an ex of mine when she would ask me as I saved money when I was at IGN, just saving, scrimping together money. And she'd be like, that's so amazing. Like what, when is it going to be enough? And you'll take care of yourself. And I'm like, just don't even ask me that because it's not going to ever be enough. And for some reason, maybe that's the same spirit that had. So we judge it, but it's just coming from a different direction in some sense. You know? Yeah, it's a good point, man. I mean, yeah, it is inherited definitely by the sons. Very similar thing. There's a definite clear workaholism that, yeah, I'm not even sure. I mean, I know I have it, but I'm not even sure I'm at the point where I could even acknowledge it as a problem. Like, I wouldn't even be ready for an intervention at this point. Workaholism is kind of a tricky, it's kind of a sticky wicket anyway, because, you know, we're drawing a livelihood from what we do it's not like alcohol it's different than alcoholism yeah. or another addiction i would be an alcoholic in two seconds like i've 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 totally realized that i've said that many times openly like if i don't watch that that's going to be a problem and it mm. got i never drank to a point of being a problem especially because i'm not a bad drunk but i did was there were times in my life especially when i was on igm when i was drinking like almost every day you know like and it's in some way not like getting drunk but like oh a bourbon oh a beer oh it's like i get it dude you know, like I can yeah. feel it inside myself being like, yeah, I know. And dad did warn me about this. And I, he probably warned you too. He's like, you need to not, he never saw me being a drunk. He's like, I know what alcohol has done to this family. Like you need to watch it. And I thought about that at, at times when I was not watching it well enough, you know, yeah, be drinking three, four or five days in a row or whatever, like going out and doing all that. It's like, no, 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 no. Absolutely. You know, dude. um, and that's why I just don't even drink in the house. And like, it's just, and it's not like a thing where I feel the need to, it's like, I need to go get a bottle. It's just, no, no, no. it's just like, I don't you you want to, I just don't want to. It's just I like, totally what's the point? What you mean. Really? Like I, I, I got to, right. I, I, I've chosen my vice. It's pot. <laughs> I don't need to have everything. You know what though? Not drinking in the house is kind of a nice rhythm to get into and make a little ritual out of going out for a drink. Right. And that's why our dinner Whether was so a- disappointing last night. Yeah, that sucks. Because you're looking forward to it then. Here's the thing. Because it's an event. Here's the thing. Just as, just as an aside. Yeah. I'm a cocktail guy, right? Everyone knows this. But I order basic cocktails like old fashions. And if I go to a really nice craft cocktail bar, like where I know they know how to make drinks, then I'll get more sophisticated drinks. I like blood and sand, for instance. That's one of my favorites. But you wouldn't order that at like a fucking random place. So I keep it with the old fashioned. Here's my advice. Let's stop fucking around with the old fashioned. Okay. <laughs> Either people make it like fruit salad or they make it over overcomplicated, whatever the case might be. Or right. what happened last night, It ha- th- there's a thing here where they, everyone has a house old fashioned. It's like, oh, we have infused bitters and it's smoked and whatever. It's like, dude, fine. But when I order an old fashioned, when I say bourbon old fashioned, which is what I say to be clear, because old fashions are really supposed to be made with rye. A lot of people would argue as well, so which is fine. I like rye too. But I say bourbon old fashioned, please. And then you give me your house old fashioned with weird bitters in it and all sorts of, sh- and I'm like, can we just stop? Uh, if I want the house old fashioned, I'll tell you, I want the house old fashioned. If I'm ordering a bourbon old fashioned, I want the old fashioned, you know, a hundred percent. So it really, Oh, and then the bartender should, if, if that wasn't clear from the wait staff, the bartender should double check that because now I, I have like. to be annoying, right? We, there's yeah, another yeah, restaurant yeah. where you already have to be annoying when we go there to be like, cause they use like weird cinnamon nonsense or whatever. And it's like, just, I don't, I, can I have a bourbon old fashioned, not the household fashion. And 90% of the people probably understand that without you having to say that. But now you have to be the, you have to go that extra mile. You're going to look like an asshole. So now I have to go to this place. I have to be like, I want a bourbon old fashioned, please. Not just to be clear, not the household fashion, a bourbon old fashioned, please. And nine out of 10 of them would be like, yeah, I know asshole, you know, but because this one woman made that mistake. Yeah. In all fairness. That's what it takes, man. And that, so it, it affects like our, you know, my ability to transact, you know? Well, it affects the whole meal because now you're creating a conflict, a potential conflict between the waiter, the waitress, and the bartender. Now there's tension there. Now the waiter's going to be in a bad mood. You know what I mean? The whole dynamic gets shifted now. The tectonic plates of the whole night are fucking rumbling, you know? It's complicated. It is. That's why it, I love good, like, I know people have a problem with the tip culture, and I do too. Um, but I just think you tip to certain people and you tip well to certain people. Um, like I realized the people that deliver my medical marijuana, they, it feels like people don't tip them. Cause like last yesterday, the woman delivered something to me and I gave her a $20 tip and she's like, Oh, a tip. 
Oh, and I'm like, yeah, like you're a delivery person, like a, like a, like, like a food delivery person or something. I'm not saying like a FedEx person. I'm saying like your yeah, brain, you know, like that's kind of stuff. part of the, but I understand the whole thing, like flipping the, the iPad over. Do you want to tip me for getting your coffee or whatever? Like I get people don't want to do that oh, stuff. Yeah, 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 sure. But uh, yeah, like that's why I believe in, and, and Eric, our friend Eric really instilled this in me is like, you want tip culture, like tip culture and some, if you like service, like if you care about service and like customizing it, because people are like, oh, why don't you just pay your staff really well? And it's like, that's not really enough. Part of getting good service, frankly, is like the performance and the yes. earning of it. Yeah. And that's why, like, I'll, if I go to a nice place and you're really good, 25, 30% easy, no problem. Yeah, that's but an like, experience. But like when you're fucking work. around with me, I, I'll never leave less than 10% unless it's a really like catastrophic situation, but I'm going to leave you the base 10%. Just because I know too many servers, I know the grind, I know the hustle, I know it sucks. I'm not going to like dick oh, you over completely. But you could have, Mike and I always remark about this too, like where they don't ask if you want another drink. And then you could tell when waiters and waitresses are good because they'll keep asking you if you want more drinks. Right. And it's like, yes, yes. Like that's, oh, you want another old fashioned before you check? Like that's, yeah, you want another $3 tip, right? Or another five dollar tip it's like that's that's the transaction that's great man and then you're serving me and you're kind of getting ahead of the i love that kind of again we always bring up scopa in santa in santa monica but that place <laughs> had that scopa. kind of service like that top notch like yeah. service like where it's like yep. on the ball they're present the perfect amount whatever the case might be you know i love that kind yeah of not intrusive right. but you know knowledgeable had a, yeah. had all the food know all the wine know whatever you know like yeah i know Going at, you don't want the waiter or the waitress with the sense of entitlement. I know that, you know, but you want them to be on the ball, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a balancing act, right? You don't want them to be disruptive, but you want them to be, you don't want to ha- wait around for another cocktail or to refill your soft drink or whatever. Well, listen, we've you been know. there like 10, 12 times at this point, maybe even more than that. That's the only bad experience we've had. And the food was good when we got it. Like, okay. Micah's food was fine the entire time. Okay. The, entre- the, the, on- the appetizer, fine. It was just my food was fucked up and my drink was fucked up. And then the mm. woman was just not present, not there to the point where oh. I hailed down another waitress and was like, listen, I don't. And she came over like it seemed like the n- a knowing look or whatever. Some maybe I don't oh. know. There's probably a hierarchy there of some sort, right? She was, you got the weak link. Right, exactly. And I'm like, listen, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know what the fuck's going on. I didn't say that, but I was like, I don't know what's going on. I've sent my burger back like 15. You guys got my, my order wrong like 15, 20 minutes ago at this point. Can I just cash out? You know, and and uh, she was like, yeah, yeah, I'll look into it. And then they brought the burger over like 30 seconds later, you know, because I was, I guess, and in, 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 I was like, fine, I guess I'll. But they still struck was the burger, busy? but I didn't like this. Do I have my wallet in here? No, I don't. I didn't like this. So they, they, they're they like, we removed the burger from the bill. Cool. Appreciate it. You didn't remove the cocktail. You fucked up, but that's fine. You removed the burger from the. um, Because I, I did drink the cocktail. I fucked up, but, but you don't really realize until you're halfway through it. It's a cocktail. It's not like it's a fucking sports yeah, drink or something. That's a good point. Um, sure. There's not that much of it. But on the receipt, it said it was struck and then it said customer did not like. And then minus 100 percent. So like it took all the price off. And I'm like, I don't like this for one reason that when someone looks at the POS data, like your managers or whatever, they're going to think that someone sent their food back because they didn't like it. But it's actually because you got the order wrong, you know, and I'm like, I don't like you obfuscating that it was your fault. You put it on me kind of, you know. But you fucked it up. And she even did this thing where she was like, oh, you're like when I was like, my my burger has like the sauce on it. I didn't I asked no sauce and all that. She's like, oh, you're right. Like, so she acknowledged. Yeah. But then I was like, yeah, I know I'm right. Like, where is the burger? You know. I just fuck. Anyway, anyway, was that notation handwritten or was that? No, no, it was like in the data. That's why I'm saying like in the POS, like if they if they dump that data and like their people are looking at it, they're gonna be like, oh, we had a we had a fifteen dollar hit because someone sent their burger back, and it's like no, right. I fucking didn't. You know, it I didn't send my burger mis- back because I didn't like it. I sent it because it was wrong. Yeah, she rang it through right, wrong. and I'm just saying that's an important because it was your waitress's fault, not my fault or the cook's fault. It was her fault, but she yeah. hid that See, Kyle- by putting that in the. No, I'm, not, I'm I'm just making assumptions, of course, but it's like you assume there's a bunch of people at this operation that are not going to be aware of that and see the. Uh, I'm just saying she got away with one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> score one for them man you and micah see I, everybody likes to go out on a weekend everyone everybody wants to go out and celebrate of a, of a friday night or a saturday night but here's my tip for you especially because you and micah have flexibility i'm sure it was busy last night it's a weekend mm-hmm. go out 
and eat something on a Wednesday. Yeah, you see, all right, so Thursday I'm glad night. you brought this up. This is a whole other thing, though. Okay. We went to this place this past Tuesday, or like a, two Tuesdays ago. Yeah. Which we never do. And we had weird, like a weird, we had like a subpar, it was subpar by their standard. And mm. that's because it's like an industry day, like Monday and Tuesdays are when like real industry people don't work. That's right. And so like they don't, it's not going to be their real chef. It's not going to be their real wait staff. It's not going to be their real. And I noticed the way the, the, the host was weird. Dude, we, we went there, we had an eight o'clock reservation. It wasn't even full. I just make reservations just to like be safe in case. Cause sometimes it's like really full. We went in there. There's probably like eight or 10 open tables. It's a pretty big place, but it's like, whatever. And we get there and there's like this weird hostess that we've never seen before. And I'm like, yeah, Hey, I have a reservation for it's like 7 55 i'm like i have a reservation for eight we're just here early um for two and she's like okay um we'll see you at eight <laughs> and literally made us sit there until eight o'clock to be seated and i and that was another moment where i'm like i like this place and i don't want to fuck around too much you but i wanted to be like what are you talking about there's like <laughs> there's a bunch of open tables because I, I what i really wanted to be like so if i just walked in here and didn't have a reservation you would make me wait until eight to sit at one of those tables that would have been an interesting test so we had that weird experience with her and then we got the food and the food was good but the, the we get this brussels sprout dish with like cheese and almonds and and bacon it's really good and it wasn't really as good as it usually is and mm. i really feel like we had we, we've been calling it actually it's so funny you bring that up because we've been calling it tuesday energy like where it's like you gotta and that's why i was you so surprised to have team. that wait sta- that wa- that waitress fucked it up it was no one else but that waitress sure yeah. sure the hostess wouldn't recognize us it's always the same woman that on fridays okay. sat us down the manager guy that's always walking around he shook my hand last time i was there he knows me in some oh. way you know and all this kind of stuff and and that's why i was like i'm not going to say anything about this like to them because i don't want to get her in trouble maybe she did have a bad day but i was sure. surprised to have that level of service on a friday that's tuesday she brought tuesday energy on a friday and that was what was so uninspired mm. about it, you know? I understand what you're saying. You got the B team. And that's why we don't go out on yeah. week. So that's why weekdays, I avoid weekdays. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, you're not getting the strongest. You're not getting the strongest kitchen. You're not getting the strongest wait staff, probably the bartender. You're getting the you're getting the the secondary team. You're getting the bench. Right, which is fine. And I'm sure there's very capable players, pro level players on that team, but there definitely are. But <sighs> Yeah, it's so funny you bring. <laughs> what about, it's so funny you ask that though, or say that because that's that is something we've discussed. You know what though? There might be a sweet spot here, man. Think about it. Maybe you guys go out. You like to eat late. You're like me. Maybe what? you go out during hours where the kitchen's not going to get frustrated. The people are still coming in, but after the the major flow of traffic starts to starts to abate, right? So you go in. You go in there for eight forty five, nine o'clock. Now you sit down for a nice meal. Still got the wait. Same wait staff. Still got the prime kitchen guys on the line right yeah that would be ideal because everything shuts down so early here like people are out of there so by like 10 there. like there's it's i'm like this is so funny like is this place is closed at 10 on a friday that's like you know, a that's co- everywhere like now. a restaurant cocktail bar i'm like yeah it suck it does suck i'm like it where does. are the places that close out like at at like last call you know yeah like where are the cocktail bars that do this i, I know they exist in like metropolitan areas but some of are hurting right now with that you know Closer to the city. Maybe you guys have to go out into the city. Yeah, we have. It's funny. Like, we're going to go there again. Like, we stay at the Jefferson Hotel sometimes and, and do the whole thing there. They have a really great restaurant, La Mer, internally, and they're on the point. You know, so, yeah. Anyway, um, back to dad. <laughs> back to dad. I mean, I guess we could, we've said well, a lot about him. I think we can just, we can move on to mom shortly, unless you have anything you want to say. But I'll just, I'll just note that I've really, I appreciate how much and i've remarked this to him many times in the past like he was right about a lot of a series of things the things he was concerned about about me the things that he would say advice he would give direction he would give i think that it wasn't perfect and i think that there were situations i found myself in that i was surprised he wasn't more cautious about like my student loan situation like thank god that i made money in my life and like wasn't struggling and didn't have this this anchor around me but i did for a long time and i was able to get out of that but 
no one told me not to do that. And that's kind of the, the realism adult conversation situation. I was saying, like, if I had kids, who knows what the fuck I would do if I had kids. But like, but <laughs> philosophically, it's like, yeah, I would be like, you have to learn from your own mistakes. And it's like, yeah, just be really careful with that because uh, that could have fucked my whole life up. You know, and I know people sure. whose student loans have fucked their life up bad. Oh, it's a big bad. deal. And I'm not saying it's not their problem. It is their problem. It's not anyone else's problem, but their problem. But they got bad advice. They didn't make the right choices and it sucks. And so we should be mindful of those kinds of things. So I'm not saying that like dad had every angle covered, but he had so many angles covered. And. You know, I don't think he would ever admit it. And I don't think it's like something you can even define, but it's like there must be something because I, I think dad loves us all evenly. But there's probably something about your sons. You know, like you look at them a certain way or think about them a certain way. And I just hope that he's happy with the way things turned out. And that obviously he had a major steering effect on all of it. Oh, you yeah, know? dude. Um, he was a rock solid person. And I appreciate his staid nature and how normal he made life for me in a very abnormal era of my life and I needed it. And he made major sacrifices for me that are not, not unseen. And I was, listen, I didn't ask to be put in these situations so, and I was a victim of them, but there were an um, infinite number of ways that those situations could have been handled. And I think from his perspective, he did a pretty nice job of handling it while balancing what must've been a tortured, emotional situation and difficult employment situation and i don't know it's just a it's a wild thing to think that you know you could end up so much like your father in so many different ways but i think i've acknowledged yeah. that more as i've gotten older and, and i and I, I don't mean that in a bad way you know no he definitely asserted his influence man i hear you I mean, he continues to be a mentor. He was always a mentor. He continues to be a mentor, someone I look up to more than anything. And, you know, I've had other mentors, you know, like I think of our grandpa as being another one of my mentors, especially when it came to art and creativity and everything like that. The only thing I, I look now as a 50 year old man at our dad and I feel so proud of him and I've always been proud of him. That's something I, I should say too, like, my dad, the firefighter, my dad, I was always, there was always a great sense of pride with me and dad, even though we turned out to be different in a lot of ways, although there are obviously similarities and I set myself after him in many ways as well. But the only thing I worry about with dad now is similar to what you're saying. I hope he's, I hope he's proud of me like I'm proud of him because listen, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be the guy slinging the hammer. I wasn't going to be the guy wielding the chainsaw. I can't rebuild an engine. I don't even want to touch you know a chainsaw. <laughs> it's pretty scary. Yeah, they're dude. scary. I don't want to use it's, one of those. <laughs> I'm not a big power tool. Oh guy. my God, me neither, dude. You know, like the apple did fall quite far from the tree in some ways. So I just hope, but you know what? I hope he's proud of me. But you know what? When I, even in saying that, even in the same breath, I know he never indicated once that he wasn't fiercely proud of me, even for all, all our differences. And I think. As somebody who has, I have a daughter, I have a son, I can kind of confirm that as a parent now from the other side of things. Like you're not proud of your kids because they're similar to you. You're proud of your kids for the things they're good at, the their, their talents, their qualities, their kindness, all the things that you try to impart as a, you know, the, their humanity, all of those things. So, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't love Graydon anymore. If he was skateboarding, you know, um, shredding the gnar ardently right now, you know what I mean? Like I, I love him. He loves basketball. I don't know where his passion for basketball came from, but it's fucking, it's so cool. Like he got, you get, I didn't get skateboarding from dad. It's the same thing. Like you're not proud of them for the similarities. You're proud of them for the type of human being they are, you know? So that's what I think about with dad. There, there was a, period of my life, like maybe in my twenties where I was like, I don't know, like maybe if I was in a, a similar lane or if I was kind of in some way parallel to dad or, you know what I mean? Like some, something adjacent to what he's doing, maybe he'd be more proud, but you realize as you get older, that's not the case. They want to see you kind of blaze your own trail, you know? And so with dad, it's, it's so funny 
looking at his legacy and everything he's done and everything he's come through, you know, to feel proud of your dad, like a, like a parent feels proud of their kid. You know what I mean? It's almost like this full circle thing that you hear about, right? Like as people get older, parents get older, they revert. And this, there's this shift in the dynamic where now the grown child is taking care of the parent. It flips. It reverses. It's not like that with our dad because he's doing better than I am physically. I mean, the man looks great. You know, he's a Terminator. But with dad, it's kind of seeing like, wow, man, this guy, you said it a little bit already too. Like he's, he's a survivor. He came through a lot. He changed a lot. I'll tell you what's funny though. My parting shot for dad, Kyle. If you and Micah do ever have kids, it's such a trip to see your parents as grandparents. Now, you could see your grand, your parents as grandparents from uh, you know, one step away, one level of separation because you see them with your nieces and nephews. But when you see them with your own kid, it's a trip because you're not, they're not grandparents the way you knew them as parents. In other words, your kids are going to think of them completely mm-hmm. differently than you once knew them. And trying to communicate that, that to your kids is so frustrating because like you don't even understand. They're like, I don't understand. Like, you know, grandma and grandpa like tell us a story and they're like, they realize it's not the same person, but they just think they were always, you know, Lily and Graydon think mom and dad were always these people. Right, I'm right, like, right. No, you don't understand. Yeah, they don't know. They have no idea. This was a different person back then, you know. Different history. And the, fr- the kind of playful frustration that comes with that is kind of, is something not to be missed, I feel like. It's so, it's so funny. And the way- not just mom and dad, every grandparent I know plays it up for the kids to believe that they were always this way. You know what I mean? Like, eh, I don't know what they're saying. They're crazy. Like I was always the same, you know, type of thing. <laughs> it's so funny how they evolve and mellow. We're saying, we're saying with you as you turn 40, you know, as you go from your 30s into your 40s, how you're mellowing. It's the same thing with them, you know, but there's these new people that come along that only know them that one way. Yeah. It's That's like, fascinating. Oh, man. It really is. All right, we've gassed dad up enough. Let's uh, move on to mom. What do you have to say about this woman? This mm-hmm. this old bat. <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we promised we weren't going to make fun of them. Mom's uh, the most decent, loyal, fiery, you know, integral person I've ever known. She's like, it's like you don't even... I feel bad when people don't have good relationships or any relationship with their mother. And I understand that when people, why people take it so hard when their mothers pass, you know, cause it's like, it's a very serious thing. It's very primal. Um, and so the thing I'm thankful for with mom is that though I like struggled with a lot of things that happened in my childhood after the fact and came to terms with a lot of that stuff in my thirties, and we've, we've discussed that endlessly on the show is like, she has really kind of consistently just been a a solid person. We had no downtime in our relationship. I don't think there were periods where like, we didn't see each other and there were periods where we weren't together, you know? Um, but I recognize, especially as an adult that my mom made an enormous amount of sacrifices for me specifically. And um, you know, I'm really grateful for it to have someone like that. It's like a very powerful thing. She's a very unique individual and you almost, you don't, I mean, you do take it for granted. It's just like, almost like that's mom, you know, but really it's like an individual and a person and a formation of that person. And so yeah, what do you have to say about this, uh, this individual? <laughs> she, uh, I mean, I wrote down a bunch of notes this morning cause it's hard to know where to start with dad, but certainly for mom, you know, there's just so much there about a mother that you've always had, you know, and for me, it's been 50 years and and the way it's changed and the things that haven't changed, you know what I mean? Those mainstays, the things that stay constant. I mean, the first thing that mom gave me that I'm so grateful for was her family, you know, bringing me into not only being the son of our mom and dad, but giving me her family, our grandma, our grandpa, our Aunt Joni, our Aunt Carla, 
And by proxy, those other people like our Uncle Mike, who I've known my entire life. You know what I mean? And this specific family, how much they meant and still mean to me the warmth, the comfort that came along with that, the sense of belonging and the love, dude. Like mom and dad were great, but, and I know you didn't know, you came along almost 11 years later. So you didn't know grandma and grandpa at the same time I knew them, but also you didn't know them for nearly the same length of time because you were deprived of that decade, that more than a decade. But those two people made me feel more loved than anyone has ever made me feel. They made me feel like a king. You know what I mean? And it was this genuine love that I guess at some point you acknowledge as a kid. It's like, yeah, I know. Like my mom and dad are supposed to love me. Like it's a default. But these other people, why are they so crazy about me? I don't, I don't even know what I did. Like, you know what I mean? But it was that level bringing me into a family that meant so much to me dude. And I have the most insane memories and two people that I miss very much. We, you know, weekly, if not daily, like I miss those two, you know, because I, and I would have loved for them to stick around and, and seen us grow up to have families and seen, you know, and met their grandkids, especially my children, of course, and seen your success and seen Dana and Allie go on to see the women that they've become and their families and you know what I mean? Like there's just something, there's always going to be that sense of longing and not having them, but being given to them, being brought into the world and being brought into this specific family, especially especially the Ruggiero family. I mean, that's the first gift that mom ever gave me is letting me be part of that and making me such a big part of that, being the first kid, being the first one of not only you guys, but of all the nieces and nephews, I was grandma and grandpa's first grandchild. So I was so lucky to be put on a pedestal, you know, and just having all that, the aunts and the uncles and the family dinners and all the warm and fuzzy memories. Talk about nostalgia, man. I mean, it's just, that was, and still is the greatest thing. And some of my, some of my best memories and my most cherished memories of a, being a part of this family, you know, being a part of that Ruggiero turned Moriarty family and then the Brasinos and the Blakes and, that whole clan, man, that whole tribe and just being an integral part of it and my memories associated with it. So it's, it's everything, honestly, you know, it's everything. The second thing, I mean, that mom gave me, and I've talked about this before, but it's so funny. It makes me realize how lucky I am or just growing up the standards, like her being the barometer by which everything else was eventually judged. You know, as a kid, you don't know how to express this in words, but she was really the perfect mother for us. You know, everything, she was Donna Reed, man. I mean, everything was idyllic. It really was like everything was done with love. If she made a simple sandwich PB and J for lunch, like it was just so crust cut off, nice sliced oranges on the plate. Everything was done. Nothing was ever just slopped onto the plate rushed and made us to feel like a pain in the ass, you know, get this to, Oh, I got to do this. Never. She never made anything feel like it was her duty. She was never disgruntled about everything, anything. Everything was just with love. The house was always immaculate. It was always clean. Our environment was always serene and peaceful and sterile. We always had clean laundry. It sounds funny, but even when you're a kid and you start to go in your friend's houses, or you start to go to your neighboring neighborhood. Maybe you made a new friend across town. You go on, they shoot to their house after school for a play date on the bus. And the house is a little dirty, right? It smells, smells weird. There's shit everywhere. Feels like no one's taking care of shit. Mom always had set, not only give us herself, but the environment. Everything about the environment, all the trappings right? All the food, the clothes. It's not like it was opulent. We weren't even upper middle class. You know what I mean? We were a very blue collar family when I was a kid, but we had, we never wanted for anything, but it was more, it wasn't even the stuff. It wasn't even the food or the toys or the clothes or the nice house. And she, she certainly did all that and made everything perfect for us. Fairy tale almost, you know, you realize as a kid. But it was the love. It was the sense of there was TLC in everything that she did. Like we were her world. 
as, as kids, you know, up until my adolescence and my teens and we moved into the bigger house when I was 13 and there were changes in the offing, but my childhood, you know, my zeros through my adolescence, that was just, you realize that very few people did it like her. You know, I had friends like my best friends, Tommy and John, John had a very similar upbringing. You know, the house was always pristine. It was always clean. The cooking was always great. She, Kathy did everything with love. Chris Giannacchio, same thing. But the thing about Tommy's parents is they he had all those things, but they also worked. You know, mom had all those things, but she was also present. There was no nanny. So she, what you realize as a grown individual now is looking back is we were everything. You know what I mean? She gave us 110% of herself. That was it. She was a mom. She wasn't really even Betty Ann. She was just Dagan, Dana, and Allie's parent. You know, she was the PTA, PTO president. She, her whole life, her whole involvement was her children. And you get to a certain degree, I would say probably by the time I was nine or 10, I realized not all parents are like this. You know what I mean? Some of them aren't home. Some of them aren't present. Some of them are alcoholics. Some of them aren't taking care of the house. The house is a mess. It's not even safe. It's not even healthy. These kids aren't getting warm meals. Like mom just did everything. You know what I mean? Shuttling us around, entertaining us, and everything done without the slightest bit of regret. And if she did regret it or if she was having a hard day, we never saw it, dude. She did it all with a smile. And that was the thing. Not only did we have it all, but we had that sense of love where she made it feel like everything was a joy. You know, like truly Donna Reed, June Cleaver style, you know, like there's no other way to put it. Like she was that level of mother, you know, I, and I was so fortunate to have that my whole, like, you know, mom and dad didn't split until I was 17. I just turned 17. Um, I had a full fledged childhood. I mean, I can't complain. Mom was that person. Yes. It started to change later into my mid teens when she started to take on a role and become a flight attendant and have a little more independence. and embrace this career woman thing, which I'm not faulting her for. So there was a shift. But until the moment she, her and dad split up, that's what I was fortunate to always have, you know, which I know in increments, we had less and less as we go down in age. You know, you had much less. Allie had significantly less as well. Dana probably didn't even have it to the same degree being two years my junior. But I always had that family and I always had that mother who was really, I mean, honestly, there's no other way to put it. She was a doting mom, you know, and everything done to a T where it was almost even negative in some way, because again, her being the standard by which all other mothers and their work were judged, it wasn't even fair, man. She shut everybody down. You know what I mean? Like she was, she was all wins, no losses. You know, in every aspect. And I remember being a kid, I feel guilty because, you know, there was those kids that got everything. You know, my best friend Tommy, who was super cool about it, and the other like shithead across town, Bradley, who was who was like the he was like the bizarro Tommy. Brad was like the guy who got everything but was really shitty and uh, you know, really shitty about it and just kind of unsa- an unsavory character. But I always thought like, wouldn't it be cool to have be those kids? But I was the luckiest fucking kid in the neighborhood, man. Nobody loved their kids more than mom did, you know? And it, it kind of, sh- that kind of shined out in everything she did. And I, I remember, I'm, I'm old now, I'm 50, but I remember what it was like to be eight and making it feel like everything she did was just chef's kiss. You know what I mean? The fact that not only she was a good cook, but it was plated nice. And we sat down and had a, you know, a nice interaction as a family and the food was warm and breakfast was served on time. And we, I never, I always had clean clothes. I never wore the same thing twice. I never walked into the house and it was a mess. It was always immaculate. My room was always vacuumed. She did it all herself. You know what I mean? She did all of this herself. It's incredible to think of. So that for mom, that's really, that's where it starts with me, you know? And I guess those things never really changed. The other, the only other thing I would think about mom as far as like establishing those standards and just being 
the best and giving all of herself is the is the encouragement, you know, the tenderness. That that hasn't really changed. And also a comfort. Like her and dad are still the two people I find the most comfort in. I could pick up the phone and have a conversation with them. They have a very not a lot of people know this. Mom went to nursing school late in her teens, early in her twenties. Now she never graduated. She was a nursing school dropout. But when I think about mom as a nurse, it makes sense because although she never finished, I think she has a lot of qualities that would have made her an amazing nurse. Empathy, kindness, thoughtfulness, a genuine caring. And there was always a protectiveness with mom, a stoicness. There was always this very strong mother bear thing of never letting us see her sweat. Mom would never induce anxiety. Like if she was worried about something or anxious or scared, she had this ability to never let on. Like if I fell and fucked up my leg really bad riding my bike on the blacktop when I was eight and I had to get stitches, she would make you feel so comforted in that first five seconds of taking you up in her arms and being like, oh, it's fine. Like she would make you feel like you were overreacting, even though you knew you were injured. You know what I mean? Like that level of protectiveness of not wanting her kids to worry and shielding us from anxiety, I think. You know what I mean? That that ability to be like, I, I if I had a compound fracture as a kid and I saw my leg bone hanging out, she would somehow make it feel like it was okay. She was very, very good at that. You know what I mean? And le- not letting on that maybe she was worried. I always praise her for that. And I tell her that. She was always making, she always would make it feel like it was going to be all right. It was never, you know, it wasn't going to best you. We're going to overcome this. This too shall pass, whatever. Like she always, even if, if she was worried, she was very private about it. She would just keep it bottled in to make sure we didn't see that look on her face. I never, and dad had the same quality, man. They were very stoic. They, you know, maybe after we went to bed, They would huddle downstairs over a drink or something be like, oh, fuck, can you believe that? Like, I was so worried. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I was freaking out. But they always hid it from us. And I think that's a very important quality as a parent to make it not, you know, to really not want your kids to worry and really protect them from being scared and being worried and being anxious. And she was, she was the poster child for that, man. She really was. Like, she was so... Thinking back, you don't realize it when you're a kid, but you look back at all the experiences, all the collective things that happened, and you're like, wow, she never once, she had to be worried about this, or she had to be worried about that, or she must have been freaking out about so and such and such. But yep, never let on. And uh, that was one of the things I always appreciated with her. And now interacting with her as an adult with problems sometimes, same thing. You know what I mean? I didn't just fall off my bike, might be something different. But she makes it, she has that quality of making it feel better, being a good listener, really being empathetic, being ready with the advice, um, being ready with the tough love sometimes. You know what I mean? Like you're fucking this up. You know what I mean? Like get it together. Like take it from me. You know, I know you, that type of thing. So, So sort of someone, I think, just the person you want in your corner. Like mom and dad are still those two people that are the, the the two primary people. If I had to choose two, you know, I have my siblings and I have my wife who are very close contenders, but I think it's still mom and dad, man. You know, like those two, that's who you want in your corner when you're uh when you're toe to toe in that prize fight. And she's always had that, you know. So for me, those are the big things with mom. Those are the big things. Family, the standards, giving us that the TLC and just that mother bear type quality that who know and who knows where that even comes from. Maybe it's a mom thing. In other words, it's a female thing that males can't really understand, but that mother bear thing is, is real. You know, I see it in Helene now as being a father, but I definitely saw that with mom and still see that with mom growing up. You know, she got that, she's got that mother bear instinct. She's got those instincts that just make her a good mom. And she's she's never changed. 
You know what I mean? That I, I feel like she really never changed. I feel like the dynamic of the family changed because that mom and dad split up, but she's still the same person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, it's funny because I don't really remember mom as a at, like in the marriage because I was just so set, you know, in second grade when they split. So you know, I have like these like passing memories. A lot of them, like I have weird, funny passing memories of mom in a lot of different situations and the things we would do and the bond we had, but it's very similar to what you're saying about grandma and grandpa, where it's like, you're like, you miss them all the time. It's like the honest truth is I never miss them because I didn't really know them the same way. You know, like they were present in my life. Grandpa died when what? 96 or 95 or something. Grandma was pretty much out of it after that. And I was kind of split off from that unit, like where I would become a visitor in that world and really never see them. So I knew them. I love them. I have memories with them, but it's not like I, they were like, I was split off and chipped off from that. So I don't have that same like longing. It's not really sadly a very relevant thing to not have them because I don't really know what that would have meant for me because I just didn't have time to mature my relationships with them for all sorts of different reasons. But um, you, you really hit the nail on the head. I think with mom in some way, there's so much less to say about her because I think it's so much more it's so much less academic and more straightforward like the emotion of a of a of a son and a mom and i and i am a mama's boy like hardcore which which is totally fine but i think a lot of it has to do with i i very similar to dad i had a similar experience i had had, had a very unique experience with mom during a very weird time in her life where it was just me and her and for a little while like for a year ali was there but otherwise it was like just and and for a year dad was there so but three of those five years it was just me and mom and uh i wonder about her in those situations like i think i'm trying to be careful about what i say but i i think a series of things happened at times in my life where I was just not old enough to appreciate any of the things that were going on and it worked in my advantage and it worked in my disadvantage and it worked to others people advantage, especially. So what I mean by that is I was too young to know that mom must've been a wreck during that period and gave up for made the choice for both of us, which is where my frustration comes from, but it like gave up like a certain life for a much worse life in my, in my opinion, like in every way. And there are positives that we gleam out of it because we were together and there are great memories and we made the best of it, but it wasn't what it could have or should have been. And the reason I wanted to be careful about what I'm saying is because the, a big anchor point in this, in this conversation about mom in that period is just, she was in a really abusive, bad relationship. And like, I look at my mom as a, she was a victim of that situation. So was I, but it's a, it makes you wonder about a person and how they were doing and what they were really doing and where their mind was at and all that good and bad. And I'm sorry that I was just not old enough to do more about that. And she knows like I was just too young and too naive to really understand what was happening and that my mom was being abused and what I was witnessing and seeing wasn't normal and okay. And it was just a timing issue. You know, um, you could imagine me being older and having witnessed and seen the things I've seen and me being in prison right now, you know, for what I would have done. But when you're a little boy and your mother is in the situations that she's in, it leaves me with a lot of uh, sadness that not that we went through it together because I didn't go through it like she went through it. Obviously, I was just a witness to a lot of it. But like that, I didn't do any I couldn't do anything. And I know people are like, you're a little boy. What do you expect? But it's like doesn't matter. You know, like that's not going to make it any better for me. Yeah. And it makes me real and, and it made me a very protective protective over her after that. As I got older, I became much more assertive and protective 
in not obvious ways, but just like, you know, just trying to be more interested in vetting things. And I don't know. It makes me sad because I know that mom must have been going through the stuff dad was going through mentally and emotionally, but had this whole other arc that cost us years of our lives and it was a very dark period. And it's easy to pull positive memories out of it because there were a lot of positive memories in that time. But, you know, I appreciated mom's strength in that era and her ability to kind of just track what was important and see things through and get to the other side of that. I thought that that showed a lot of grit and perseverance in hindsight. You know, and again, it's very similar to just not knowing the questions to ask, not knowing the things to say in the period of time when you're just younger and more naive. But I think mom showed a lot of character. You know, and so I think that there's so many obvious things to say about the connection of a mother and a son. Like I said, it's almost not even worth saying. But from that perspective, you know, you saw a lot of strength, a lot of character, a lot of a lot of determination to get through and to survive. And she made an enormous number of sacrifices for me. I also think that it's fairly obvious that if you were to look at the situation is transactional in such that mom feels like she, she cost me something when I was younger. I feel like she really, and I, I feel like she really went out of her way to try to make it up to me in a lot of different ways, specifically by just being present, giving me an academic like window to kind of pursue. I wasn't, it's not that I wasn't going to go to college. It was just that I, I didn't really care. I was in, I was very, eh, whatever in high school. I just, it wasn't until mom really put a boot in my ass and said like, you could actually make something of this and like go to a real, like a really good school and, you know, and help me pursue that. And she was there all my years at Northeastern working there. So I would go and visit her and see her and we'd go to dinner and we'd go to lunch. And we had a lot of moments like, like a lot. The thing about mom and I is that we have had more unique alone time together than any of the siblings, right? Just based on the just based on the proximity of everyone's ages to when things went down. And so that just gives us, I think, an, a unique relationship. And, um, you know, I care deep. I mean, I, I care about her more than I care about almost anything and ever, you know, she's my mom. So yeah, it's almost, it seems a little anticlimactic in some way to not have more to say, but I think she, and this is not an insult to her at all. It's not at all. It's like, it's just, it's much less complicated. Yeah. <laughs> For yeah. us, maybe the girls would look at it differently and they would see dad in a more straightforward way and mom in a more complicated yeah, fashion. Maybe it's a gender thing. I don't really know, but you know, I've been exposed to who mom is for a very long time and she's just a very consistent, she's made mistakes. She's done stupid things and she's hurt me, you know, but I've hurt her and I've done stupid things too. And she's just always been very patient, kind, decent, like, I don't really ever remember her being mad at me about anything or like there, us having a problem. And that's probably more on her than me. I was probably a dickhead sometimes. But um, yeah, so in some, so that's kind of what I have to say about it. I mean, it's, it's so straightforward. It's just so obvious. We also talk about her a lot more in that sense. But yeah, what else do you have she to add to the conversation? I mean, you really are a mama's boy, though. I want, it, it, it reminded me of something. I mean, I have a mama's boy here, you know, a genuine mama's boy. And being a dad and being in that environment, and I have my own special relationship with Graydon too, but he really is a mama's boy. And if you're going to be a mama's boy going from your adolescence into your teens as a 13 year old, like you could see with Graydon, like the sun rises and sets with Helene. And that's a relationship, you can't fake the funk with that. That either happens or it doesn't. There's no way to, there's no way to, to fake that. You know, it's just something that exists and it's a bond. You know, it's a bond. So I know, like you, he reminds me of you in so many ways. I say that a lot on the shows. But yeah, he has that thing too, which reminds me though, because I really never considered myself a mama's boy or a dad, daddy's boy. Like I, and I think it has a lot to do with the way I grew up. Like there was a neutrality. Like I love mom and dad equally. I never really was on one side of the fence or the other. I know you're a big mama's boy and you spent a lot of time individually with both mom and dad. So it's interesting to see that play out. But I think there is a special dynamic between a mother and a son, especially between a mom and the youngest son. But I wonder about our sisters. 
and what they consider themselves, if anything. I suspect they're more along my lines where they don't consider themselves one or the other. Again, because of the way we grew up. I was born in 73. Dana, 75. Allie came along in 78. So we had much different childhoods. Allie, 79. 79. But yeah, because we're right, because we're five. Allie and I are five years apart. And Dana and I are about a year and a half. Um, But it's a very similar thing to what you were saying with grandma and grandpa. That that time, like that decade of space between me and you was all a difference. Like you being, not, not that you were robbed, you were born in 1984, you were just born later, but you not having that time, that same decade of that same almost 11 years with grandma and grandpa changed the whole dynamic. Like you never really got to know them. You were around for about five or six years before mom and dad split up. So you had the cohesive family for a much shorter time. And that affects that affects. Yeah, everything. and I'm not even trying to get into that again because it's just like we've done that already. You know? No, of course. But like that, not. but that yeah, that was just relevant to to the the grandparent situation where it's like I I sadly don't feel the same way. You know, like when I no, hear you would like we, our cousin Jamie, who's four years younger than me, talks even affectionately about grandma and grandpa, and I believe her, but she's so much younger, but she was there. Yeah, it was proximity. You know, so it's like with her. So, because it's like I can't relate to what you're saying at all, you know. Yeah, she was around them at least weekly, but oftentimes daily. Right. She was young. Right, I so, mean, she was young when they when they went, but she would remember more than I would for sure. You know. Sure, that's a good. That's a really interesting dynamic. Jamie would be really interesting to talk to too, because she really represents a whole different, not really even generation, but a whole different POV as far as perspective and proximity and growing up in Nassau County and staying there and. You know, just being closer to everybody for longer, um, and coming out of at a time where you know she wasn't around long before mom and dad split. You know, so that's a, that's a very interesting sort of component. She has a very she would have a very interesting voice for me in the family. Mm. Yeah, but mom, you're right about mom. Like she has the she has qualities that I think I always definitely admired and maybe in some way washed off on me through osmosis because you're not teaching this stuff like her her charisma her sense of humor um she's very charming she has a very self-effacing quality the ability to laugh at herself you know she's a very humble person and you know she you're right she's a virtuoso with patience i mean she has the patience of a saint I mean, I remember being a kid. I think I was a good kid. I think we were all pretty good kids, but I do remember purposely like seeing how far I could push her. Like, you know, like testing her patience. Like, how much can I, you know, when I was really little, it was like things like asking her for something like one too many times in the store. Like, why can't I have this action figure? When it was older, it was like busting her balls. You know what I mean? It was like, how much could I make her? before she starts hitting me with a wooden spoon because I think it's hilarious type of thing. And it was kind of a half playful thing for me and for her. But I do remember trying to push our buttons because it was kind of a game. It was like she could take a lot before she snapped mm. and you know, kind of making this game out of it. And she was just a good friend, man. And she still is. Like she's the person that I know I could talk to, call up on the phone, even if she's like taking her little cat naps at nine o'clock at night. Like she would wake up and talk to me for three hours. You know, um, just having that, you know, having that unconditional, I get that from mom and dad. It was always unconditional, right? But having that, that person who is your champion that could always be relied on and, you know, it's a thing that, you know, that's why a mom and dad are irreplaceable. You know, you know what I wanted to ask you though, man, because I think back to mom's bad relationship. And I remember, you know, you, you talk about that perception of when it happened and, and thinking like, oh man, what are you leaving that for this? I remember as a 17 year old, even having a little more worldly knowledge at that point than you being like, she's leaving that situation for this. We have everything like what, you know, like not that, that lack of understanding, you know, the fact that the whole thing just mystified me and a lot of it, listen, a lot of it was due to ignorance then and now. You know, like, I don't think I, I don't think we know everything that went down. And also just, you know, I was beholden to what I knew at 17 years old. So what the hell did I know at that point? So there were a lot of factors there, but I do remember feeling that. It was like, I don't get this at all. 
You know what I mean? It seemed like everything was on the up and up to me. It seems like we, this was, you know, we were like living in the lap of luxury. I'm not just talking about material things. I'm just talking about like, as far as like, you know, the typical American family setup, it was idyllic, you know, but when she got involved in her terrible relationship to meeting our stepfather, now her longtime relationship with Larry and now her new husband with Larry, there were two or three relationships in between that terrible relationship and Larry. How did you deal with those? Hmm. And how, cause you must've been, there must've been a knee jerk reaction if not panic. Yeah. So like the first guy, like the, the abusive guy, Andy, they broke up. Like my mom married him at some point. I didn't go to the wedding. Um, and then they ended up getting divorced, obviously like not too long after that. And I had kind of, it's, it's strange. Dude. This is why I want to do like acid and ayahuasca and all that kind of stuff. Cause I need to connect yeah, yeah. with these memories. Like there is all of, there's so much detail like granular detail to this era and I know some of it but not really all of it anymore like I don't I know I didn't go to the wedding and I know it was a big deal that I didn't but I don't really remember any of the drama around it at all I remember um like our dad basically moved to New Hampshire to extract me from this situation um and did successfully get me like away from it or whatever and uh so when that was over, so the preceding boyfriends like I didn't really I wasn't around in a full-time capacity she dated this guy John, who was I fucking weird that. as fuck. And he was an he asshole. Was a weird dude. He went to Wentworth, which is a really good engineering school. Um, like as an adult, obviously. And uh he was a weird dude, but I what I, I think I said this before. I had a weird memory. Like my friend Graham came and visited me from the internet in nineteen or in two thousand. It was ninety nine or two thousand. And he like this guy, this guy, John was like, like said to this kid, he was like 16 or 17. Like, I don't trust you. I don't know you like all this like weird kind of shit. I'm like, who the, so what? it was just like a weird thing. I also think he stole money from mom. So there's that. Is that I right? think so. Um, and then, so then that was that. And then mom dated that guy, Mike, who I was mentioning earlier. And I liked him. He was nice. He was a nice guy. It just didn't work out. For he was, nice he was, a, he like owned like this greenhouse. He was Dutch and he owned this like greenhouse fabrication company on Long Island. And he was a really sweet guy. That. He was probably 10 years younger than mom or something. He had his own daughters and I used to go to Islanders games with him. He was very nice to me and I liked him a lot, um, but it didn't work out for whatever reason. And then mom met Larry and that was over 20 years ago, I think at this point that had to be. Yeah. So it's been a long time since they've been together. They didn't get married until more recently, but they were to get, they were together for probably 15, 17 years or whatever before they got married. And I think a lot of it was because my mom was married twice and she was embarrassed about that, but that we don't really count that marriage. And, uh, so that's how I dealt with it. And, they, and that's why I'm so glad that mom found someone like Larry, who I have a, a really deep affection and love for. And I always have. And it's funny how long I've known him. Like I've known him for so long. Like, he helped me move out of college. You know, like that's how long we've known, like not only known him, Holy but been, cow. but been like in his life enough that he would do us favors and we would hang out with him and do all those kinds of things. And he's always been a very decent, imagine how patient you have to be to be with mom. I mean, I just told him that like mom's mom, God bless mom, but she's very like, I lived there for a few months, right. With them. And mom's got a specific way of doing things, you know, like, and mom's just gonna like mom even if you want mom's cell phone to stop chirping every five seconds it's gonna chirp every five seconds <laughs> to the point where i'd have to go downstairs and shut it off myself like because i could hear it all the way upstairs like the constant fluttering of that noise as she's getting text messages or whatever. i'm like how do you deal with this if i were larry i would murder myself for having to See, deal with that. i think it's a patience i was just praising him for his patience the weekend of the show riding back and forth on the train i wasn't praising his patience with mom so much as his patience with the family. oh yeah he's definitely He's a passenger. Like he knows what it's all about. You know, like he's got it. He's like, he's on the train and he's, he's doing, he's there at the family functions. He fits in, like has his own little niche, you know, the guys kind of gather on the couch and watch sports, whatever sport might be on. And the girls are yapping it up like women do. He's a bona fide part of the family. Like mm -hmm. it does feel like he's been around forever now. But yeah, he's he kind of plays his role. He has his station. And yeah, there's a there's a specific amount of patience in that. You know what I mean? Where you're you <laughs> it's terrible to say, but 
But I feel like, and I don't know if you agree with me, maybe you would disagree with me on this, but I feel like in this family, if you're not like OG, like die in the wool, like if you don't go back to the 80s, you're always a little bit of an outsider. Yeah. Always. Helene's a little bit of an outsider. Everybody's a little bit of an outsider in this family. I think Derek you know has I mean? kind of breached it a little bit. Like where he's. Yeah, well, he may. He may be the best example. Well, because I can see that. the difference between. There's such a huge difference between him and Jonathan, for instance, right? In terms of like. Yeah, sure. What I perceive as their comfort, relative comfort, and all those kinds of things. Like, I don't really have. Right. A, like, I have a person, like a deep personal friendship and relationship with Derek. I don't really have that with Jonathan, you know? So, like, you have to give that time to develop. Like, Derek and I yeah, go to the dinner tough. and, like, hang out. I'd like to get there with Jonathan as well, but that takes time. It's because as Derek time. said at our wedding, because Derek officiated my my wedding where he was like, you know, I've known this person so long, like, you know, and that, that level of familiarity just takes time, you know? So it's all about proximity. Helene would be the same, but she's not been proximate, you know? No. Like Derek's in the mix, away. like very much in the mix, you know? It's got to, it, the mix is, impo- the mix is really important. I wonder what's going to happen with Aunt Joni and Uncle John that they're not in the mix. I think Uncle John likes that he's not Definitely. in the mix. And I, don't blame him because I think you, I think Uncle John's a little bit of an outsider, oddly. You know, Helene's been around almost 30 years in the family. But yeah, it's that thing where it's that dynamic. And I think I'm guilty of being part of it. I'm not accusing the family of anything. I just think there's this thing, there's this rite of passage that's, I, t- I think it just takes time. Well, isn't it? Like, yeah, I feel it's bad y- for the Jonathans of the world. It's yin and yang, though, because time. like you are proximate to the, the Catherwoods and therefore, you must be an insider, right? Oh, hundred percent. So like you can't maybe just, you just really can't have both maybe unless you're where everyone is, you know, like Derek yeah, yeah. isn't very present in his family's life. He's very present in our life. I barely know Micah's family. She's like very much in our family, you know, it's right. just all about proximity. Yeah, proximity plus time, some it. equation, you know, like whatever. Yeah. I, it's true. I think you make a good point there. I don't know any families that it's, it exists both ways. Well, because Jonathan sure has a great does. advantage in that he's proximate, so that should lessen the time yeah, necessary yeah, yeah. to you ingratiate himself. And I'm sure it will. Right. I'm sure it will. Yeah. 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 So Well said, dude. Yeah, I mean, so that, I mean, that's, you know, mom. I mean, <laughs> she's been on the show. You guys know her. She's gotten a lot of FaceTime on this show. She loves your attention. And, uh, I love that you guys have been so welcoming to her. She's like, she enjoys it. I think she enjoys seeing her sons do this kind of thing. But I also think she just enjoys the culture around the company. And like I said, and I said it at the live show and I've said it earlier in this episode, she's just my biggest fan. Like that's, that's part of what I was making fun of earlier is like, I don't really feel like I have to earn anything with mom because it was what you were saying. Like, like it's not that she has low expectations of me. It's just like, I can't really do any wrong. I don't think with her. So it's like, I don't, I'm not trying to impress her really, you know? And that's like a great advantage in some sense too, to be comfortable and have that kind of person in your life. Like I don't, I don't envy, listen, everyone's got their own situations. People don't ask to be born into these situations. We were very lucky in some senses. And I'm lucky in other senses too. I wasn't completely lucky. My childhood was fucked up in many ways, but I don't understand or can't relate to, let's say, people not being close to their parents. Like that seems, that's like anathema in my whole experience. I don't always talk to dad. I'm always on, up his ass and like we're not always texting, but we're present in each other's lives. And that's, that's important. And with mom, I mean, I see her pretty often and not probably not as often as I should considering our proximity, but it's just good to be around everyone. And um, I don't know. It just felt like an appropriate episode to do considering, uh, the mushiness at the beginning of Sacred 300 and just kind of what I was thinking about and people's desire for more Moriarty lore podcasts. So that's basically it. I mean, do you have anything else you want to bus. say? Yeah. I mean, you know, is it a, when we throw them under the bus, is it like a, a city bus or is it a school bus? I always see it as a school bus, like a yellow bus. Yeah. I see a so. yellow bus as well. We're suburban people. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see like an MTA bus or anything like that. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's the image. That's the iconic bus is the the orange school bus, right? Yeah, we got to we it's nice to take them out from under the bus mm-hmm. a little bit. They are they are good people. They were really formative in these uh these two people's lives, so it's important. And they're all right. We know we give them a hard time, fair amount of ribbing, you know. We like to bust chops. I mean, busting chops, talk about rites of passage, right? Like that's just that. That's how you show your love. When someone's busting totally. my chops, right? I know that they they 
there it's like that I'm taking I'm expending a certain amount of time and energy on you. If I didn't care, then I wouldn't even I would just ignore you. You would be a ghost. It's funny you say that. Um, Micah was saying like, oh, I was just talking to to uh, Dustin. You know, he's his wife's pregnant or whatever. I keep busting his balls about it on the show that he didn't tell me. <laughs> so obvious that I'm busting his balls and that it's a joke. But, you didn't know first. No, no, no. I didn't. Know, I didn't know. You found out. That's the, the show. joke. Is like, why didn't you tell me sooner? Like, that I just kind of busting his balls and very much within the line of our family, our family's humor and all of that. And Micah was like, dude, like over on reddit there's like a thread where it's like people are really like think you guys are fighting and and awkward and i'm like dude like how disconnected so i went reddit i was like how disconnected from reality do you have to be to think like what kind of what i just can't believe people grew up in worlds where like that level of ribbing is like oh my god i'm gonna fucking cry you know it's like jesus christ come hang out with us sometime it's part of like the rite of passage and i think people in my life know like that are close to me know that like when i bust your balls it's like if I have something serious to say to you, I'm not going to say it on a podcast. Um, right. And I think it's fucking hysterical to lean into it and be like, and just keep asking. So I keep asking Dustin, I'm like, do you have anything else you need to tell me? Like, do you want to fill me in on anything else that's going on in your life? Anything else you're keeping secret? Yeah. Like, and people are like, God, Colin, like, let it go. And I'm like, dude, it's a joke. Like, we all know it's a joke. And I even, so after I saw that Reddit post, I messaged Dustin. And I'm like, hey, dude, did, um, Michael, let me know that there was this, like, this Reddit thread. I, and they think that, like, they're interpreting things a certain way. I don't want to like hold all the power here. If they, you can tell me like, is this like interpretation correct? And he's like, no, like, it's fine. He's like, I don't. So I'm just like, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not serious very often, or at least like there's always a tinge of humor and everything. You yeah. Know? Sarcasm. And I love busting balls. Like, I think it's so funny. I'm busting people's balls all the time best. in the family. You know, that was done oh, to me so constantly. I, people were always, but people are incessantly busting my balls when I was a kid. You know, like nonstop. That's how we Uncle, were raised. Uncle Mike would always be like, oh, what are you wearing? Or like, you know, like just like little, like little things like that. Oh, what's going on with those shoes? Yeah, a week you could know? not go by. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. You could call it. With someone like Uncle Mike, like it was like, I would get ready on a Saturday night knowing I was going to see him for Sunday dinner. I would know what he would be busting on. Like I could call it a mile away. Like that was, we were steeped in that. You know what I mean? It was almost like a. Yeah, I mean, Pete, you know what's funny? Two things about the Reddit thing. I think people just really like drama. Sometimes I'm guilty of that too. And I do wonder if you take a cross section of that Reddit post, how much of those people aren't from the Northeast? Oh. Where I think yeah. that, that this is like the place of sarcasm and busting balls and you know what I mean? It's got to be some, I don't mean to accuse you guys, but it's got to be some Southern, Midwestern, West Coast thing because- we we just understand like there's always kind of an offbeat, off kilter sense of humor to everything. Like I feel like almost nothing's ever 100 percent serious. You know, it's a it's a it's a it's a mindset or a mentality almost. I feel it's a like. way of coping. That's all it is. I think that's true. It's a total defense mechanism. Too. Just generally speaking, yeah, it's like yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not gonna. Yeah, totally. It's awesome. I mean, I love it. It's just a way of being and I'm I'm down with it personally. So Yeah. Sarcasm is just that. I don't even understand a world without sarcasm. <laughs> I'd rather kill myself. <laughs> um All right, Dave. Well, let's uh let's wrap this up with a dad joke. All right. Oh my gosh, did I just put it away? I had the best one right here. Oh my gosh, I hope I left it on top. I might even remember it actually if I can't find it. Oh no! How right can here. you always okay. be so ill prepared every time we do this? Like every time I had we these, do this. I was shuffling through them the entire time. You're and never just like, okay, here yet. we go, and then you like read it. Like you're always like scrambling, like it's a surprise. Well, I have them here, and I was going. Did you notice I was going through them the last ten minutes? And then I found one that I know I haven't read, and then my OCD had me put them back in the box and close it up again, just not well, thinking. Well, take out the card, Alex Trebek, and let's fucking get going. He didn't read the card from cards. <laughs> Yeah, this is a new one. I'm excited. Kyle, how was the handsome runner described? I don't know. He was very dashing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that one. Yeah, like he I was very dashing. A, a, it could it could have it should have been like he was dashing. You don't yeah, need very. No, you don't need very. How was there. the handsome runner described? He was dashing. Yeah, he was dashing. Yeah, like you don't need that. Oh, you know, he like, was dashing would have been yeah, better. Yeah, way better. Yeah, very, it makes it. Way better. He was very dashing. Who wrote that shit? 
All right, come Throw on. Throw in the Who trash. Are... They're London. We I remember this from last time. Yep. Table fun. Oh, New York and London. So I don't yeah, know. I don't know. On someone. <laughs> that was too much. You're getting too cute. Less is more. Less is more. Brevity. All right, my friend. Let's get the hell out of here. Do you have any closing comments before we go? No, that was fun. It was nice to be back uh, doing knockback with you. It's the podcast that just, I, I want to come up with something nicer, but what I'm trying, the the approximation is it's the cockroach of podcasts. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. It just, uh, it's got this weird hardcore audience. There are like between the video and the audio form in like maybe 10 to 12 to 15,000 people that like listen to the show, you know? It's, it's a lot. It is. It's not as nearly as big as some of our other shows, but it's it's uh, well, it's not big of, as big as any of our other shows actually. But it's it's the smallest. But by like, far. well, not by far. Punching punching up small too, but it doesn't. We don't go every oh, week, up, so sure. it's hard to kind of new. gauge that. But I don't care. I like to just do it. Like we're doing it for a paying audience. It almost does. This is what we were saying earlier, right? Like we're in this beautiful ecosystem where it just doesn't matter. This would have been. This would have no place anywhere. We don't sell ads on the show. I think we've sold ads on the show like once or twice. Like this is not a show that we make right. any money on at all. Maybe on Patreon, but that's unquantifiable unquanti- because we have no idea why mm-hmm. you're actually there. So, because um, I have this feeling if we ever canceled it, like we would lose patrons, you know, but I don't know, but I don't really, uh, that's the thing is we've talked about it many times. Like I don't want to cancel it. We just don't have, we just can't do it as often for the time being. You know? Right. It works. Um, all right, my friend, we'll have a good rest of your weekend. I got to go outside and mow the lawn now. It's gonna be great enjoy um thank you it's so long i don't know if it's going to be like one of those problem mows you know where it's like constantly stopping the mower and shit like that why don't you just do the half blade and then do, like do it twice it's already at the top like i already uh, mow the top because that, that's good for the grass yeah yeah that's at the recommendation of, of dr vaughn himself so the <laughs> chemist that takes care of my lawn godspeed all right my friend will be well and uh, thank you, you all out there for your love kindness and support of all things last day media patreon.com slash last day media for early ad free access lastdaymedia.store for merch. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show is conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 